a man who identifies as non-binary. Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get it on. No choice, we got a mandate. Get it on. Always excited to have Frank Grillo back in studio. Frank's got a movie. It's in theaters and on uh, VOD today, as you hear this. It's called Lights Out. It's uh, very Frank Grillo-esque. It's good. It's action-packed. And uh, Frank does a lot of acting in it as well. I, I do some acting. I do some some sentimental acting. Maybe overly sentimental. Look at that poster. There's a lot of heads. Good poster. Good <laughs> killer cast. cast yeah. Killer cast. Yeah, good people. And, Kai uh, Pfeiffer, Jamie Key. Yeah, man. And uh, Frank's kicking ass and taking names yeah. in this uh, film. Cowboy Cerrone. Oh, yeah. Donald, yeah. Donald Cowboy Cerrone. the only Cerrone. time I beat up Cowboy Cerrone. <laughs> <laughs> Cowboy Cerrone lost a uh, MMA fight in a, in a way, and I, I guess it was with Conor McGregor. Yeah. He got shouldered, which I'd never seen before. Yeah. You know, we've seen elbows, I, and we've I, seen every form of choke and every arm bar, but, but Conor McGregor was shouldering him. It didn't make sense. And, and I was like, it seems like he should avoid being shouldered. Well, first of all, I mean, you know, you box. You, your face should never be front to head on the shoulder, on the, on the front of the shoulder. You come to the side of the shoulder. And it seemed like, like you just said, um, move your head. And Cowboy is one of the most seasoned. I mean, I think he's had more fights than anybody in the UFC. Yeah. Um, it, I was shocked because I thought he was going to beat I thought he was going to beat him. I thought he had a shot at it for sure. And when he was getting repeatedly shouldered, and I don't know. This is why this is why I would be a horrible UFC fighter, because the part where they're like stomping on the guy's foot, like yeah, on the top yeah, foot, yeah. I'd stop and go, oh, come God, on. Stop. What are we doing here? <laughs> I, know, I mean, I if you land a good right, I, I'll right, respect. Absolutely. But you're stomping on top of my foot I, I now. Know. I don't. It's just really effective. <laughs> I know. You're throwing a shoulder over and over again and it's like it's like it was jarring i was like what the is this real yes yeah and i it it, it seemed to me like cowboy cerrone at that point just lost his will a little bit like he he by the fourth time he got shouldered he was just like listen i'm, I'm not doing i'm this. going home i'm not yeah i'm not doing this and I, I think i think that first oh there it is i think the first shoulder shook him i i, I because yeah, his head, look where his head is. It's exactly where it shouldn't be. Right, right. right? Yeah. Look, he's I mean, almost putting his head there. But, you know, listen, oh. if, if you can use your shoulder as a weapon, then you are a weapon. <laughs> That's essentially like, I killed this guy with my nut sack. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, 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 I choked I, him out with my own sack. I mean, like, <laughs> look, he's over and over again, and he's putting his head right back there. Maybe the fight was fixed. I, I don't know. And by the way, whether it's the fight is fixed or the Super Bowl is fixed or, um, you know, Travis Kelsey isn't really dating Taylor Swift. I All I can say these days is I don't know well, a- anymore. I used to say, oh, get the fuck out of here. Now I'm like, I don't know. Uh, but I have to tell you something. My 55, 54-year-old ex-wife, intelligent woman, uh, is a Swifty. And I mean, she's a Swifty. Like... Like it's a religion. Yes. And and it turned into, a, I had a conversation with her because I'm like, really? You li- you li-? And she's like, you don't understand. And and what she's doing, she's she's going to she's gonna get Biden reelected. And, and, and this is a whole, and it's a whole thing. And they're going to re- rely on her to, I'm, I'm like, what are you fucking talking it's conspiracy. about? Conspiracy. <laughs> yes. It's, and, it, but you know, the other thing too is why does everything have to be so interconnected? Now, that's what I mean. I mean, we went from Taylor Swift, who sings, listen, God bless her. She's the biggest entertainer on the planet, maybe ever. She sings. It's it's like cartoon music to me. I mean, I don't you know, God bless her, but it's cartoon music. Somehow she is related to um, our country's future as far as who the president is going to be. I know. Like when I was young. There were there were pop bands. Uh, there, there there were the Bay City Rollers. Right. But nobody said the Bay City Rollers are going to get Gerald Ford elected. So like, Saturday night. Nah, 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 nah. I'd be like, I, what the fuck are you talking about? I know. <laughs> well, that's what I said. What the fuck are you talking about? And then I realized it wasn't just her. That that's actually there's a theory about that whole thing. Now I don't want to go down a rabbit hole with it, but I'm like, is, 
is this what we're talking about? Is this is this what we're talking about? Is really? I everything is on the table now. <laughs> Everyone is talking about everything, and I don't like it. It's, I, it's crazy. I don't man. like everything being connected to everything else. I, I know, I know, I know. And Travis, Travis, what's his name? Kelsey. Kelsey. By the way, I heard Leno talking the other day, and he was talking nice things about. Um, I digress about uh, Taylor Swift, and he was calling. He was calling. He was calling her boyfriend Kelsey Grammer. Oh no, that, <laughs> right, right. that was Letterman. 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 The same era, same <laughs> yeah. alliteration. L. You know, his wife from the other room. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I, it's, it's all. <laughs> but. I don't know, man. I don't know. I don't know what we're do going to do. Think we're in Taylor trouble. Taylor Swift can actually <laughs> swing a vote, though. No, I don't. No, I don't. She, she got well in the doc because I watched the old doc yeah. from like 2017 or something. She was opining about the Tennessee election and the Republican versus the Democrat, and at some point against. Um, the concerns of her team, her publicity team, she said, I'm taking a I'm taking a stand. I'm I'm gonna go with the Democrat. Right. right. And when she did that, she was delighted that tens of thousands of people now signed up to vote or register or whatever. She right. made a big impact, but her candidate lost. It was Marsha, whatever her name is, right. the Republican that won. It's also I, I found it kind of insightful because she's sitting around and Taylor Swift is in 2017, you know, thereabouts. And I realized that the sort of propaganda works. And I, I know the thing about propaganda is it's a two way street, right? And one side says propaganda and the other goes, what about your propaganda? You know, but she's sitting around and she's talking about the Republican woman whose name escapes me, but we'll, we'll find it. Um, who who is running against her Democratic um, congressperson. And she goes, when she's talking about the Republicans, she's like, if she gets elected, they're going to take gay people and throw them out of restaurants. And I can't have that. Like, I need to say something about this. And I'm always like, do you really think that's what's going to happen? Right. And, and they're like, yes, she gets elected. You, gay people, people are going to be able to walk up to like gay couples in restaurants in Tennessee and like tap them on the shoulder and go, Get out. take your hiney out of here. Yeah. And and I'm sitting around going, that's never going to happen. <laughs> it's not going to happen. It's not what the other person is saying. It's not what the bill she supports says, but they, you know, they do that. They're going to rip children's books out of the hands of Floridians with special needs mm -hmm. and throw them in a bonfire. And it's right. like, no, they're not going to do that. But it's interesting that they got you to think that, that way. That's right. And if they do get you to think that way, then you are compelled to say something. Because if they were going to take black people and gay people and round them up and throw them in the Grand Canyon, then I would go, yeah, well, then I got to say something. Right. Except for I'm not stupid. <laughs> right. And I, I know they're not going to do that. And by the way, here's the other thing. When it never happens, do they ever pause? Never. So, I mean, Taylor Swift... Can't have what's Marsha Blackburn. Marsha Blackburn. She can't have Republican Marsha Blackburn in uh, in charge of Tennessee because Marsha Blackburn is going to take gay people out of restaurants and throw them out in the street. Okay, but then Marsha Blackburn wins, and five years goes by, and nothing happens. Does Taylor Swift ever see that, or think about it, or sort of contemplate it? Or do they just move on to the next hysterical I, I whatever? Think, I think they move on to the next hysterical thing. And I think it is a lack of education. It's, a, you know, e even, you know, I, I and I'm not going to get political and crazy here, but you use you, all these protesters in New York and L.A. About, about Israel and about Palestine, you know, the river to the sea. And, you know, you ask them, which river? Right. They don't know which river. Right. They don't even know the name of the river. Right. I, and I say that because I'm like, first of all, there's it's steeped in history, that part of the world. And if you want to take the time, you can learn about what that's going on there. But I think we've got a group of younger people who take a a little bit of a of a of a blip, a gif, a little sound bite, and they run with it. Right. And that becomes 
the the genesis of their stance, and that's the I think that's the problem that we're running into. I mean, I I'm kind of amazed at what's going on in our country. Amazed. Well, as I'm, as I always say, I always thought the computer was going to fix this stuff because you right. would be able to, and not even a computer, your phone, uh, in four minutes you'd be able to figure out the river to the sea and why you shouldn't be screaming about it out right. in public. Right. But you didn't even take the four minutes, and that's the part that kind of freaks me out. <laughs> me that too. All literally, the information is in your hands. Seconds, not even minutes. You're in right. Seconds. I, I'm talking about it's, myself and the yeah. way I. <laughs> but, uh, it's in seconds. I mean, it's everywhere. You can do. You listen. You can go onto Prime, and you could, if you're really interested, you could see the history yeah. of Israel. You can go right. watch in an eight part the history of Israel. And, right. and you could really learn what that's about if you wanted to, and then you could make you could make some kind of educated assumption about what the hell's going on. Well, we're not using it to be educated. Like, we're, we're not using it to be quickly influenced, and then and and, yeah. and, and create divisiveness. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're yes. yeah, yeah. So anyway, I mean, uh, and and the movie comes out tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, wait, let's go. <laughs> no, I don't know where I went. <laughs> it's good. Uh, mm-hmm. I watched it. Oh, and it's I really fun! Enjoy yeah, it. yeah, yeah. It's it's. Uh, you know what? It's it's. There are uh, movies that exist that aren't fifty million dollar movies, and we get to make these movies, and there are platforms for them, and you get to get great people together, um, and you work harder than you would if it was a movie that was fifty million dollars, because the elements aren't all as kind of great. But sometimes it comes out okay, and I think this one's, it's solid. I think this one is worth, you know, you can sit down and enjoy this at home for 88 minutes. What's in the pipeline for you? I have a movie coming out in theaters, which is a little scary. I like I like living in this kind of, this streamer world. Mm-hmm. I have a movie coming out in, in theaters called Werewolves. What do you think it's about? I hope werewolves. It's about werewolves. All right. All right. <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of like the purge meets werewolves. It's like the super moon comes out once a year and <laughs> I have to save the world from the werewolves and it goes on and on and on. It's actually really good and fun and so that's I have that coming out. And then Creature Commandos, which is the animated version, hard R version that James Gunn and Peter Safran are launching the new DC with. Mm-hmm. So I have that. And from that, I'm going to do a bunch of other DC things that I can't talk about yet. So you're doing a voice with Start that. Start out with the voice, and then we go into live action. Yeah, James Gunn's a real creative force. Oh, my God. I mean, he is He's as and he's as nice as he is talented, and and him and his partner Peter Safran they run DC now, yeah, because um, they are creative as well as as uh, as executives. Uh, they're just so dynamite to deal with. I mean, they're just they just get it. And he's already turned that whole DC universe upside down. Since yeah, he took it over. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the business I feel is filled with people that you just never want to talk to again and then some that are just salt of the earth the best and i can't figure out there doesn't seem to be a lot of fair to midland kind of in between it's just executives where you go i never want to work with this person i never want to talk to this person i want to see this person and then the folks where you go god this guy's so good this girl's so good yeah and and you it's so it's so kind of goes against the grain and and you know it's such a kind of a they're 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 kind of like unicorns you, you know because the rest of them they have a job to do, and they have big responsibilities, and and uh, y- y- they don't really care. <laughs> they, right. These guys care, man, and uh, what they're do- Gun is so talented. Like, it's me and David Harbor and and uh, Maria. I'm gonna assassinate her name. Maria Bakalova. She's terrific. She was in Borat. She got right. nominated for an Oscar for Borat. All too. right. Um, uh, but they got a, a bunch of people that are just elevate this stuff, and Gun writes like. X-rated, <laughs> and it's funny. It's a, it's for adults. So I had a ball doing it, and that's going to kind of launch the whole DC world. And and uh, I'm going to retire from that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, I mean, you're in such amazing shape in all these movies, and it seems like you stay ready. I don't, yeah. I don't feel like your walking around weight is any different than no, no, film. No film weight like what happens with fighters and wrestlers and you know people that have to get it together but what is your uh, regimen like what how do you do it it's pretty simple like i i i every day 
I box every day for two hours, um, and I train with Justin Fortune at Fortune Gym, who's, who's Manny Pacquiao's conditioning coach. So we've been training together for a long time. I train in my sauna suit still every day. Really? I do. And then five days a week at night, after boxing at night, I do strength and conditioning. Um, so, And I do that all the time. And I, it, listen, it just keeps me... I'm like a robot, but it keeps me sane, man. It just, yeah. it, it does. It keeps what's, me. What's the diet like? I, I eat once a day. Um, I, I do like the bulletproof coffee thing in the morning. I, my version of it with, you know, uh, goat butter and some really high end coffee and stuff. And that keeps me going till about four or five. And then I'll, I'll eat a meal. You know, I'll make a steak and some veggies or sweet potato. Mm. And, and then microdose with your son. And then microdose <laughs> with my son. It's, yeah. it's awesome. <laughs> What I, I've never done microdosing. You haven't? You no. should. You're a great candidate for microdosing. I'll take that in the spirit in which you No, meant you it. are because you're so you're you're such a creative mind that it just takes it a, a step further and it kind of opens shit up without getting, you know, wasted. Yeah, what is where does the line where's the line between microdosing and going on a ride? Great question. Like microdosing, say say you have a chocolate bar and each chocolate bar has these little squares. It's cut into twelve squares. Five of them say would be microdosing. Uh-huh. You take it a step further and then you're macrodosing, and actually that's actually good for you too, because then you you go to another dimension, right? Mm-hmm. And that has helped me actually break through. I know this is gonna sound like L.A. actor guy mumbo jumbo, but I've I've had experiences where I've kind of taken a a whole chocolate bar, uh-huh. just kind of sat in my bedroom alone mm-hmm. with my windows open, and I've I've kind of had a wonderful eye opening experience, and I it's it's hard to articulate, but I don't do it often. Do you know what I mean? I've mm-hmm. done it a few times, and uh, there was certain music I put on, and I have somebody who kind of tells me what what I should kind of surround myself with. Mm -hmm. Because I've had friends who have microdosed like and unknowingly, you know, were listening to self-help tapes. Mm -hmm. (laughs) No bueno. Well, here's here's an interesting thought because I was talking to uh, an actress, comedian. I I don't think she'd care if I said her name, but it doesn't matter. She's an actress, comedian. She was talking about the whole ayahuasca thing. Yeah. And... You know, my my first blush, and, and so I'm not uptight. I've done mushrooms, smoked the weed, you know, right. I don't care. Uh, but my at first blush, I'm sort of go, well, I don't really need that. And then they go, you purge all of the negativity, <laughs> yeah. all the self-doubt, all the angst, you know. And I go, I don't really have that, you know. <laughs> now, it's, it's not that I feel great about myself. I'm just sort of, eh, Right. I'm, I'm sort of, uh, I don't have strong opinions this way or, or that way about myself. I'm kind of agnostic right. about myself. And, and people go, yeah, but what about all the anxiety? And I go, I don't, I don't really have anxiety. I just do what I want to do when I, when I want to do it. And then I try to do my best. And I realize my base is so much work and so much blue collar work and so much shit work and so much moving cinder blocks and drywall and shit like that, that... Just getting up, talking to Frank Grillo, talking to Kennedy, you know, talking to these people, you know, getting on a plane and going to Vegas and doing a couple of shows or right. writing a book or making a documentary. I go, what, what, what's my anxiety level? I'm not doing anything. I'm just doing what I want to do. Right. But they go, oh, you get to purge, you know. And But now here's something that we should try to wrap our minds around. Maybe this was unnecessary in the past. Maybe microdosing and ayahuasca and, and all the stuff we're we're talking about. These these, these going on these places, you psychedelics. Know, you, it's yeah. psychedelics, yeah. but how about just self care? Right. Like you're sitting right. in a sauna, an right. infrared sauna for a half hour, and right. then taking a cold plunge didn't and exist. then getting back into the yeah. sauna. You know, it didn't exist. Not in Western, not in Western society. Right. right. But maybe I should change my mind on this a little because. Maybe in the past it was unnecessary because in the past you got up, you chopped wood, you went back into the cabin, you started a fire, you went and cleaned a deer, you know, yeah. you gutted a you, deer. You, you washed your body in ice cold water. You, yeah, like all yes, the things yes. that we, you, you know, all the things that we're f- discovering have right. been here quite a long time. Right. right. And so, so you went out and you just lived 
an organic, healthy life. Right. No TV, no smartphone, no pop tarts, no CNN, no yeah. pop tarts, right. no all night jumbo jack taco combo, <laughs> right. jack in the box. Just you're eating just venison jerky and, and worried about where the next fire is right. coming from. So. Those people probably didn't need to go on an ayahuasca cleansing trip no. because there wasn't anything to cleanse. It was just work, you know. But I can kind of see now if you're inundated by information and crazy imagery and negative imagery and this constant stream of shootings going on right. and, and what's going on in Ukraine and, right. you know, the, what uh, what this vaccine may be doing to you or whatever, whatever. And then all the conspiracy theories and everything. Maybe we do need to go on this journey now. Uh, you know, it's it's interesting because I've not done ayahuasca, right? For mm. that reason, I, I you know I, my, now I have a very young girlfriend. Thanks very much, guys. Appreciate <laughs> it. And she's from Brazil, and she's mm -hmm. from the jungles of Brazil, and she was a translator for shamans. And, you know, while people like us, Westerners, would come and, and she, so she was a translator. She's done it 150 times, right? And, you know, she's trying to get me to do it. I'm like, and I'm like you. I'm like, I don't have those issues. I'm not – I don't – I don't have anxiety. Like I have other things. I don't. I don't, by the way, any woman I've ever said, I don't have. The, oh, you have. Them. Right. right, right. Oh, and she said the them. same thing. She laughs at me because you know you're angry. I'm like, I'm not. I, I can get angry, but I'm like, I don't have those insecurities, those feelings. I don't believe in childhood trauma from my. It's like I. It, I think that's an excuse. Uh, a lot of times that's a crutch for people as they get older. They go, oh, well, I'm, I'm dealing well, with it, my trauma. It feels like they're indulging themselves. Right, exactly it, right. It, it feels it, like sitting back and looking, examining every wrong that was done to you from zero to 19. It feels self-indulgent. It is. I think it is. I think it's ridiculous. I, I personally, when people give me the, the, you know, the trauma ticket, I'm like, forget it. Just right. forget the trauma. Like it's unless you were really if something. Yes. Because your father yelled at you to cut the lawn every Sunday. You're that's not trauma. Right. right <laughs> that's right. not trauma. You know what right. I mean? Um, but she, you know, she was she, she's kind of trying to encourage me because you know when you're ready. I'm like, <laughs> I'm old. What do you mean when I'm ready? <laughs> do you know what I mean? And so I've I've always been like I've I've like I've had friends. Like my buddy Gavin O'Connor, who's a you know directed warrior, like a stud, Ivy League, fucking all American football player. Like, and he went and did ayahuasca once, mm -hmm. and he was like, okay, you know, I saw some dark shit. Mm -hmm. I had somebody holding my hand. I saw some dark shit. Okay, is Gavin any different? I personally, I can't see a difference, but he, yeah. he wanted to try it, and, and he did. Well, and, well, I didn't know there was this version of ayahuasca. So when I was talking to this comedian actress. I thought everything was book a trip to Brazil, carve out five days, right? Stay in some sort of ayahuasca retreat, right. you know what I mean? And and it, you know during the day you'd eat a continental breakfast, and at <laughs> night you'd trip your balls <laughs> off, and then you'd go to the gym on Sunday. You know, <laughs> she said, balance. "Oh no, this this is here. This is like local, like in the valley or something." Oh, and, oh domestic? Oh, you don't. Want I, and I was like, "No, like in the, like in the basement of a church." In a garage. Yeah, no, no. And that's I was, not it. I was no, like I, in a garage. She's like, yeah, there's probably about 30 people. I go, no, in, no, a, in no, a garage? No. How does it work? Well, yeah, everyone gets their throw-up bucket. They just put it next right. to them. Oh, my God. And I'm like, how much? And she's like, 400 bucks. And I'm like, I think I'm going to save up and do the one where I get my own nurse. Yeah, yeah. no, you, you need to go. If you That's right, I need to go somewhere. You need to go to the jungle or, or you know, it's somewhere out in the desert where it's a shaman, and a legit shaman, and he shouldn't be white. Yeah. He yeah. should be a different color. And, Certified. and you know, it's a guy who does shaman stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I'm not, you know, my, like Shamans I've had. Shamans look like the only, it's the only job they have. No, I've had friends who go, you know, we're going to do a, an ayahuasca ceremony in the Hollywood Hills this weekend. You want to come? I'm like, with like Stephen Dorff? Like, yeah. no, I'm not coming. No, yeah. I, you know, I don't want to um, watch Stephen Dorff smoke. <laughs> <laughs> and I love Stephen Dorff, but I don't want to do ayahuasca up there. You, you know, it's like this is a is a ceremony that is you know ancient and and it should be treated as such. And I, I've just. When people then I have friends who would do it over and over again, like the mushrooms, and I'm like, now you just want to get high. So right. that defeats the mm -hmm. purpose of what it really is, which is to open you up, you know, emotionally and spiritually and intellectually, blah, blah, blah. You just want to get high. So you're replacing the ayahuasca 
uh, with the from the alcohol. All right. You, you know, and that's what a lot of people do too. So, but the the microdosing with the mushrooms, you know, is, I I do it a lot less than I did when I first stopped drinking. Interestingly, mm -hmm. like when I first stopped drinking, I think maybe I felt like I needed to kind of replacement replacement. I don't even do it that much. I've become so boring. Yeah. Though there's something, and um, I, I'm i with you in that I think we're misinterpreted when we yell at everyone to get over it and rub some dirt on it and start walking, you know. But I do, and I've always subscribed to this, and you'll, you'll find it when you have kids. So when a kid is five and they scrape their knee and they get a boo-boo and they're sort of up on the ground, you know, sort of right. sitting on the ground. And I have the same, you know, there's the five second rule with food. I have it with kids. Kid hits the ground. <laughs> yep. I don't care if there's a compound fracture. It's like on your feet, here we go. Because it stops them from completely. Right. And what I've found is when mama's around, mama becomes an enabler. Right. His mama goes, oh, my God, oh, my God, what's wrong? What's wrong? They go, he's getting my knee. Oh, my God, oh, my God, get the Bactine. And She's they go, afraid. And they I'm go, afraid. They, right. they, they, they spiral deeper yeah. versus you're okay, no problem, back on the feet, here we go, walk it off. And they kind of get out of their mindset a little bit. And then you become the bad person right. because you're the one who's not being attentive to their needs. Yeah. But what I'm saying is, is, you're being attentive to their needs is actually causing them to spiral further in the wrong direction. Right. Tell them, and they're going to grow off. up to be. That's bags. how they will process uh, information. Everything. And I, I see it because <laughs> because my girlfriend is quite a bit younger than I am. I I am uh, sometimes around her friends. Not often. I, I won't allow that. But. <laughs> um, and I und I see the way they take in information. Yes. how it affects them and then what they do with it, you know, and how emotional they become and, right. and how they each be, make each other emotional. Right. And right. therein lies, I think, a problem we might have here in this yes. country with people of a certain age. Yes. Uh, when it comes to, you know, them feeling a certain way or not getting what they want or what they've expected. Well, uh, they also. OK, yes, yes. you and I. We should write a book or just microdose <laughs> and go on a 40 mile hike. We should do the John Muir Trail high on mushrooms because we still won't be done with this conversation. <laughs> but I, okay. They see they're working under the premise that we have a bunch of shit in us that we won't unlock. Correct. And we won't <laughs> mine all the anxiety and all the fear and all the hostility and all that's in us. And I keep saying, I'm an empty vessel. There's nothing in me. I had a shit childhood, and then I got to fuck to work, and now I'm happy. Right. That's it. <laughs> right. That's right. it. I just go to work, and I talk, and that's it, and I get paid. And it's a shitload better than anything I've ever done, and no, there's not a bunch of stuff trapped inside of me. And they're going to use the ayahuasca like it's a key for a sardine can. Right. You know what I mean? We're going to open right. this up we're and get to, it. get to it. And I'm saying I'm Al Capone's vault, and you're Geraldo. Right. There's, there's nothing, nothing in there. There's just dirt. <laughs> I, 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 there's, there's nothing to brother, find. I feel the same way. And you know, some people. Call, and then they go, "You're in denial." Yeah, you're in <laughs> denial, or or you're you know, or you're a little sociopathic. It's like you know. <laughs> yeah, my, 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 I was You're out, on the spectrum. Uh, I mean, I was in a movie, uh, doing a movie. My mother dropped dead, right? It was Tuesday. She dropped dead. I was like, oh, fuck. I can't believe my mom. I went home and, and I, you know, eulogized my mother, got back on a plane the next day and told Sony, I'm coming back to work. And they said, really? I said, yeah. And I'm like, well, well uh, uh, what am I going to do? I mean, my mother's gone. I got a, I got a job to do that I like doing that's going to keep my mind off my mother dying, right? And then three and a half weeks later, my father killed himself because my mother died. Right now, wow. like, wow, wait, what year is this? This is like right before COVID, wow. and, and so we couldn't even bury him because we had the, all the old family, the old Italians came from my mother, like they couldn't come back three weeks later for another funeral. So, we didn't. So, I, I was like, okay, he's gone, and it's time to move on. And, and people would say to me, You're not dealing with it. I'm like, right. No, you're wrong, right? I'm exactly dealing with it the way I'm gonna deal with it, and it is incredibly sad, and I'm gonna grieve, I'm gonna grieve. But it's n I'm not holding anything inside of me. It's not like I'm afraid to tell you I'm grieving. Or it's just the way I've got a, a finite amount of time left in my life. Yeah. And this happened. 
This yeah. happened. It's tragic. It was going to happen someday. But the way I'm dealing with it is I'm going to continue on doing what I'm doing, which is like you said, you know, you have a life. You, you, I found something I'm doing that pays me more money than I ever thought I would make. I enjoy doing it. I enjoy the people I'm around when I'm doing it. I'm going to continue to do that. It'll make me feel good. And I got on with it, right? And the, 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 the problem is they want you to not be okay. People want you not to be okay. Yeah. How well, could you be okay? You can't be successful and you can't be happy and wealthy yeah, and, and do what you want to do and go on vacation. And there's got, you can't be, you can't have money and be happy, right? People, no, I know. My mom died. My mom was not a fan of mine. I'd, I'd say a fan of my work. Right. Let's say, probably. Uh, she was old and uh, then she died. And I was like, all right, next. And everyone's like, oh, no, 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 yeah. no, no. The first thing's first. I was like, listen, you're looking at me and my mom through the lens of you and your mom. Your mom made you chicken pot pies when you were sick, and your mom had a college savings account, and your mom said her son was her hero, and your mom is in the stands of every Pop Warner football game. That's not that's not my relationship. I have a different relationship. My, my mom's a sort of you know, strangers in the night kind of relationships <laughs> right. passing at, at night kind of relationship. So, A, don't make my relationship with my mom your relationship with your mom. It does not... It, it, it does not simulate that at all. I did not have that. You're, you're grafting your own mom personal feelings onto me. And then people go, but it's your mom. And I'd go, no, it's your mom. Right. Not my mom. <laughs> my mom. I moved out from her when I was 12. I didn't move <laughs> right. back. Like, right. She didn't care. Like we, don't, we didn't have that, number one. Number two, though, she was old. She died. And she there's a there's a transactional sort of, practical side of it too where it's not like my mom died and I went who the fuck's gonna pay my mortgage now right right right, 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 right. <laughs> and it's like I don't have to build a deck for somebody who can't afford a deck on their own house and fix their roof you know like there's you, you remove the sort of pragmatic side of it right and then there's a practical side which is uh most people don't make it to 89 she made it 11 years longer than the median, whatever. So that, that's good. Yeah. And she's not in pain. Right. And now she's gone. And we can wring our hands and grieve for whatever you think the amount of time that's appropriate. Right. Or we can go back to the set and make some hay while the sun shines. Right. And then they go, okay, you're not dealing with you're it. You're not dealing with it. Right. You're not dealing with it. And I'm like, no, I'm exactly dealing with but it. But I think it brings us to a bigger problem, which is something that I've been thinking about a lot, which is a sort of um, process people versus kind of nuts and bolts people, right. which is there's more and more people want to talk about the process. So they go, everyone needs a seat at the table. No child should be left behind. Everyone's entitled to world-class health care. No humans illegal. We are a sanctuary city who welcomes us. It's like, okay. And then you go, okay, now we have a big homeless problem and there's illegals living on the street. And they go, all right, let's have another meeting. And then they have another meeting and they discuss what needs to be done, what should be done with proclamations. No right. child left behind. Right. Nobody's illegal. Uh, these aren't, you know, illegal aliens. These are undocumented Americans, you know, lots of names and stuff. And then they go, all right, let's break for lunch. And then they break for lunch. And then the problem gets a little worse. And then they show up again to talk about it. Right. And, and it feels satisfying to them on, on some level. Whereas the people that are nuts and bolts go, what the fuck's the plan? What are we going to do? Let's, let's start tomorrow morning. You want to get rid of the homeless? Me too. What right. are we doing here? Right. And they go, we have a subcommittee and we're talking about it. Right, right. And it's like, yeah, but that doesn't mean shit. Absolutely. Well, I want to do something. And so I've, I've realized that there's a whole group of people that just want to process. They just want to talk about your feelings and your mom and your lack of grieving and you being on the spectrum of something and bearing your feelings deep inside and not dealing with. And meanwhile, nothing happens. Like, I'm saying, go buy a headstone and put the bitch's name in it, and let's turn the page. You want to just talk about, about, about this, this how thing. I should feel. Right, and it's global, too, now. With well, L.A. But it's, is, and is and now it's a also, process city where we all sit around and talk and about what we want to do, but we don't do anything. No. 
And that's the problem. That's and it's where so we're at. it's so hypocritical because I mean, you see the problem. I'm I'm watching the people in New York being flown in and committing crimes and beating up cops and getting released. And it's really it's phenomenal. I, I mean, I don't know what's going on in the world, and. We're talking about we have to take all these people in. And what do we do about all the children who are in our country now, who were born here, who live here, who are going to bed at night hungry and have, you know, they're educated. I mean, when does it st- when does it stop? We have, I think, we have begun the process of destroying what this great country has been about. I mean... Yeah, I, I, you can't have. First of all, you can't have a country with no borders. You, I, I agree. You, you can't, right? I know this is horrible. It's it's a it's a hot topic, but what's happened to our country from the the illegal immigration? Uh, and I'm not talking about just from the. I'm talking about who we're letting in. Well, I, you know, you know, it's kind of there's a bunch of funny stuff or interesting stuff, which is like. Everyone would go when we're talking about building a border wall. It's like, oh, border walls don't keep anybody out. They keep people in. They're not effective. They're not effective. Walls don't work. They're not effective. That's what you'd hear from the whole side. Then Greg Abbott puts together a hodgepodge of shipping containers. Right. He puts together like three miles of shipping container and puts barbed wire on top of shipping containers and nobody goes over. They all they all have to go around. So in terms of walls don't work, then maybe we should replace them with shipping containers. Yeah. <laughs> but, but let's put it this way. Obstacles work. That, that's, that's, that's how you... When you're like when you're a kid and you're like walking along the schoolyard or the freeway or the old mill or something like that, you walk along the fence until you find the opening in the fence, and then, and then you, you go, go through. through the fence. Right, but you, right. you, the fence worked until <laughs> there was no fence, and then you you would do that. But you know, here's what here's my take on this country, and uh, Frank Grillo, you can tell me what you what you think. We are very robust, and and when you're robust. You can handle a lot, meaning, I'll give you two metaphors. Like I'd have friends in high school, and some of them were just jocks, and they are just, you know, looked like Frank Grillo looks without working out with their shirts <laughs> off, and that just God touched them and stuff. And those guys could, like, smoke and drink and eat all the shit they wanted, but the hand was so strong, you know, genetically, that it just never showed up right. on them. But at some point, they turned 49, you know what I mean? And it started to creep in, this this lifestyle, you know? And, and another metaphor would be, you take certain cars that can be a little finicky, like a Jaguar, especially back in the day, right? right? And then the Jaguar... You needed to kind of look after the Jaguar, park it out in the rain, the ignition would get wet, it wouldn't start, the points got wet, you know, blah, blah, blah. You need to kind of keep it in the garage and keep after it, you know, because, well, it's been, it's been 4,000 miles, time to come in and get the, get the points gapped and the, you know, the valves adjusted and whatever. But then there are other cars like a Honda or a Toyota, and you get like a, like a Toyota Camry, you can just fucking keep driving it. And you don't have to change the oil. You don't really have to maintain it. You can kind of drive right. it into the ground because it's so robust. Like, it's so well engineered that it can almost withstand. Like, you can go 50,000 miles since I changed the oil. Right. Like, it fucking starts every morning. I, <laughs> right. I, get to, I get to work. But at some point, even that car will hit its saturation point and it'll break down. And I feel that way about the United States. Like we're so robust that you can take eight million undocumented guys and just shove them into our society. And we go, you and know what? Okay. The fucking trains are still going right, to run, right, and right. I'll still go down to LAX, and the flights will be coming in, and I'll get my paycheck, and we'll go to the we'll go to the cinema and watch a movie tonight, right? And I'll go to the Outback Steakhouse, and there'll be a steak in front of me, like like it is. But like the Toyota. Like, at a certain point, it becomes overwhelming. Right. And we're kind of getting to the saturation point. Like, we can only have so many people not paying taxes and so many people being a burden on the system. And you see it in, like, Denver, Colorado. Right. Like, hey, there's sanctuary city. Well, now there's 2,000 migrants. And it's like, they can't absorb. 
as robust as New York is, as robust as, as California is, yep. we can't, we're, we're now at a saturation point. That's right. what you're seeing right. now. That's I, that. By the way, that's a great, anal- those are great analogies and that's exactly it. It's, you know, I, the, the analogy I used to use was, you know, uh, we started killing buffalo. There were like 60 million buffalo back in the day in the Wild West, never believing that, you know, me with my, with my, with my one shot Winchester could f- wipe out. About 60 million buffalo until the day where the last buffalo was shot. Right. And that's what I, it's the same thing. I feel like that's where we've come in the country where we've kind of opened our, like, did we not think about the consequences? Because what's happening now, like I watch it in New York, there is not only crimes being committed, people getting our cops being assaulted. These people are cheering themselves on. They're, you know, they're in New York cheering, uh, you know, pro- uh, Osama bin Laden chance in yes. New York City. Now I was a child of, I was a, an adult of 9/11. So, so, and it, this to me is is I, I can't even wrap my mind around it. We we have kind of destroyed. Talk about the Constitution stuff. We've destroyed what the country was built on. My family were immigrants. They came. They went through Ellis Island. They did what they had to do legally. My girlfriend was the same way. She came, took her 10 years to become a citizen. She went through a lot to become a citizen. And what's happening, you know, letting all these people in, not that we're, we're not taking in the doctors and the lawyers. Right. <coughs> you know, bless you. So what's the end? I said, what's I don't the know. end game? I, have, I keep what, asking what the end game is. Do we is. ship them back out? What's the end game? I, I, I don't know. My, it's a simple equation. You're either here legally through a process or you're not. Right. And, and everybody not, should be here. If you can get through legally. Yes. Right. And everybody is welcome. That's what the country is based on. But now you're affecting, you put too many carp in the stream and the carp are going to eat the good fish. Yes. And eventually you're going to have a stream full of carp. Yes, and, and, and we have gar- that. And they're yeah. garbage fish and we don't need carp, right? And so no. that, that's what's happening. <laughs> so- yeah, it's a good, I mean, Dawson or Byron can look it up, but the, uh, one more analogy, which is not even really an analogy, but it's like, I'll, I'll butcher it a little, but 50 years ago, for every one person collecting Social Security, we had like 43 people paying in right. to Social Security. That was 50 years ago. Now, for every person collecting Social Security, we have 1.7 people paying in. So what I'm saying is, is we were robust with 43 people for every one person, right? And we could the system could also handle 25 people for every one person, and maybe 13 people. But we're heading toward less than one, right? And when we get there, then the system collapses, and it's not sustainable. So we are the the Camry that can take a lot, right? But eventually, we're blowing a we're blowing a gasket, right? Well, let's see what this thing says. So I don't know how to make heads or tails of this. Let's see. So put up a chart ratio of social security covered workers. So the first the first column are the people paying in, I believe. Ah, uh, so uh, right. right. So in 1940 there were 35,000 paying in for 200 people essentially, which is a pretty good pretty good ratio because right. the 35,000 could float the 200 people um, by the time let's see now oh, but it only goes to, to 2013 20, 20, yeah. so we'll, which is before the problems began we'll figure we'll figure it out anyway yeah. uh frank's here we got the news we do yeah we got the kennedys coming up uh we'll take a quick break we'll come back with frank grillo on the news right after this Well, let me tell you about Just Thrive. Life can be overwhelming, and it's not just your mind that suffers stress. Messes with your digestive and immune system, too. Just Calm, the breakthrough new stress-busting formula from Just Thrive. Exclusive mood-lifting blend of clinically proven. Well, it's proven to help you relax and breathe easier in as little as four weeks. And uh, I also love the award-winning Just Thrive Probiotic, which is in me as we speak. I take it every day because I believe that much in this brand. It's a spore 
based probiotic, and it's a thousand times better in terms of survivability than most probiotics. Banishes bloat and constipation, so your gut can produce more serotonin. That's your happy hormone. Plus, it supports better sleep, all with a money-back guarantee. I know the couple, they're very much invested in this company because they believe in it believe in it and uh, I believe in it too. Just Thrive, right Dawson? Right now when you go to JustThriveHealth.com and use promo code Adam, you can get 20% off a 90 day bottle of Just Thrive Probiotic and Just Calm. That's like getting a month for free and a portion of every purchase goes to Vitamin Angels, a nonprofit organization that saves the lives of millions of children and moms to be around the world by ensuring they get the vitamins and minerals they need to stay healthy and strong. To learn more about this groundbreaking company, don't miss Adam's interview with Tina Anderson, founder of Just Thrive. Take control today with Just Thrive. It's time to check Adam's voicemail. Ace man, got a rich man, poor man for you. One word, incest. Get it on. You can leave us a message at 888-634-1744. Frank, Frank Grillo in studio, lights out, name of his action-packed movie, available on VOD and, and in theaters. Yeah, the mansion tax. Mansion tax. <laughs> That's yeah. so... Mansion tax. <laughs> it's not a mansion. Uh, I know. Well, everything everything is euphemistically described so that it's like essentially, let's not call illegals illegals, let's call them dreamers. And let's not say Frank Grillo lives yeah. in a house he bought, let's yeah. call it a mansion. Yeah. And then it'll be much easier to do what we want. Right. Once we've how, labeled it, how dare something. you have a mansion, right? <laughs> <laughs> the other day, I walked into Starbucks. I had a t I had my, my buddy sent me this cool T shirt with a, a kind of a American flag on it. I ordered my tea, and the girl's looking at me strange, and you know, I'm I'm a, I'm a white guy, I guess, right? And she's looking at me strange, and and I go, "Are you okay?" And she goes, "Nice shirt, like that." Right. She maybe was twenty. Had a flag yeah. on it, right? And I go, I go, I go, oh. You, you don't like the American flag? And she just went, Pfft. No way. <laughs> no, and so it. I was confused. <laughs> like, I, I actually was confused. And I was like, what? Is, did I miss something, right? Because I don't leave my house very much. So I go home and I was talking to my son. We weren't on mushrooms. And, um, <laughs> and I was telling the story. He goes, yeah, no, she thinks you're a radical right wing, you know, fash. I'm like, w wait, what? And and I, you know this? Do you know this? Like I'm yeah, wearing yes. an American flag, and and I'm like, are you are you kidding me? Like that? First of all, you work for Starbucks. You're 20. I'm an adult man. Like, you, <laughs> by, by the way, if you were, had a Palestinian flag on your T-shirt, you would have got a free egg bite I, I, with yeah. your tea. I, I mean, I mean, it's amazing. It's, it's amazing. crazy. It's it, amazing. And and. Uh, it, to me, it's all it's all part of the same thing, you know. My mansion tax and this young lady who the, the, it's all it's all become so. And I don't know if it's because I'm aging out of life. I don't know, but I'm like nothing is making sense to me anymore. <laughs> well, I have this conversation with, um, and maybe we should start a podcast called "Aging Out" with Frank. <laughs> Uh, and every day was like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> That's, by the way, that is my mantra. What the fuck is going on? So I have these conversations with Dr. Drew, who's also aging out as right. well. And so you have to do it. Like, okay, I would say it applies to music as well. Like where you go, what is this shit? Like, what is this chick talking about her fart tank or something? Right. You know what I mean? And why is this thing? It sounds like shit to me. And then you go, okay, old man, you don't know. And I go, well, it's true I'm old, but it can also be true that this song is shit. shit. Like, right, right, right. And so it's like you start talking about hard work and motivation and, you know, intestinal fortitude. And they go, okay, old man. You know, and you're right. like, okay, I am old, but I still say diet and exercise. And that works. Like I'm still talking about shit that works. Let's 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 forget my driver's license right. and what it says for a second. Right. And I'm and, telling and you, and I don't live in a, in a cabin in tennis in the mountains in Tennessee. Like I may be old, but I I'm way cooler than you. Like, yeah. I'm, you know. You know. Like you're, you're a twenty year old girl in, in Starbucks. I'm way cooler than you. And it's like, uh, the, that's the other thing. I, I guess 
the hatred for the United States of America that I've, I've, I've been encountering by a certain generation of yes. human beings is appalling. It's, I, it's, I it's agree. A, it's appalling to me. And, you know. and it has to make them miserable. That's the other part. Like if you think the climate is going to change to such a degree that we're all going to be gone in 10 years, why wouldn't you be miserable? I, I would be I, miserable. I, I, I would be miserable if I thought... You know, if I believed all the things they believe about the United States, I would walk around with a pretty low to medium grade depression all day, every day, yeah. because you're living in a horrible, oppressive, racist regime, you know, the and worst, the worst. the worst. And, and you're living here. And good news is it all be done in 11 years, according yeah, to Al Gore. So, yeah, yeah. yeah we'll, we'll be able to celebrate. <laughs> All right, what do we got for some news, oh, Chris? Um, so you guys are talking about UFC. Well, Dana White was in the news. Mm. So he was on Howie Mandel's podcast. Mm -hmm. And it was very confusing. So I'll just play. The, this is the first minute of the podcast. Dana White, you are an amazing guy. You are, I can't thank you enough for being here. Uh, you and Ginger seem to be getting along. Um, you are not only an amazing businessman, you are an inspiration, you are a philosopher. The way you do business, the way you uh, conduct your business and your friendships and media is, uh, I'm, I'm jealous. And But Dana, I can't thank you enough for being here. Thank you. For all the kind words, I appreciate it. I, I am so fucking tired of doing podcasts. It's I, I, I'm literally done with them. I'm not doing any more podcasts. I gets up and leaves, and he just leaves. And Howie and his daughter just looking on. Ginger, by the way, is a, a YouTube comedian, <laughs> and, and just walks out. I did Howie's podcast, and his daughter got right. up and Somebody laughed. Somebody has to really? leave on the show yeah. every time. Why? Uh, she wanted to know my thoughts on COVID, and I told her I didn't give a shit. And then she wanted to know like where my mask was, and I was like, I don't wear a mask. Yeah. And then she was like, uh, What about me? I'm compromised or something. And I was like, I don't know. You deal with it, you know. Was, was and then she sitting two, two and, inches away from me. No, she was <laughs> sitting twelve feet away from me. And then she said, How do you feel right now or something? And I said, I had a cold like three days ago, and she just got up and left. Oh my God! I know. <laughs> I love Dana. Actually, it happened I, I, I twice. Dana. I think. Yeah. I know Dana well. I know. I know. I know Dana, and he's uh, he's the, of, of an amazing. Dana. I love yeah. Dana too. And, and by the way, we gotta get him on the pod. Yeah, I don't think he'll come on know, anymore. Says says what he thinks and thinks what he says, man. It's, you know that's why people you know are so but refreshing. Something yeah. happened. There was something, something else. Something was in his eyes. Somebody said something to him. I think that would yeah. be my call. It's very confusing because Howie was very complimentary, almost for too the, complimentary, almost too complimentary for the first twenty five seconds. I will say that his daughter is very aggressive with sort of COVID stuff. At least in my experience of getting her to leave, I think, wait. That's his daughter. Yeah, yeah. I think she left two times. One time she cried. Yeah. I did the show two you. times. <laughs> One time her daughter cried, and then the next time she left. Yeah. Is she okay mentally? I Is that I, why maybe so he has her on the show? Because I, she, I, I, my whole thing is we're, we're circling back to our original conversation. <laughs> why be so delicately wired that douchebag Adam Carolla could come in there and destroy your day <laughs> by just saying, I don't care about COVID. Over COVID? I mean, right. are we still talking about COVID? She was. Uh, this wasn't that long oh, ago. okay. I mean, it was a few months ago. Yeah, but, but still, haven't we realized it was all a bunch of Not nonsense? her. <laughs> not her. She's, she's steeped in it. Now, so oh here's the God. here's the thing. She may have triggered, or somebody may have triggered, like I, I was doing, I was with Howie two days ago, and we were doing Byron Allen's show, and I was in my, my trailer, and they came in to do the COVID test, and I was like, are you fucking people still doing this they shit? They are? That's what, I, that's what I said. Like, what are we... You're still doing the thing. Right? The nasal yep. swab. Wow. Yep. Uh, nasal, by the way, 15 times around yeah. because 13, it wouldn't be effective. It's 16 would be gilding wow, the lily. I, by the way, I took the swab. I'm like, bitch, I'm not counting. I'll right, just do right, it until right, you look right. down and then I'll hand it back to you on the fifth. Right. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, oh three Mississippi, God. four. So each nostril, 15 times. I did one six times and one four and a half times. <laughs> it's like, I go, what the fuck are you guys doing? You're just going to just keep doing this? She's wearing a mask. She's doing the nasal swab. I'm like, what are we doing? And she's like, we have to do it until we go one month 
with no positive. And I'm like, oh, this is great. So <clears throat> this this is a goal that's not achievable because somebody's going to be infected it, somewhere in this month. Mathematically, it's just not. It'll you can't be done. Reset, now, the yeah. person who's infected will be fucking fine and won't even know they're infected. Yeah, my so that, kids just had it. That's beside yeah. the point. But no, we're going to keep doing it until <laughs> whatever the fuck. But I I bet you. I was with Howie. I was talking to Howie the whole the whole day. Somebody did something covid you think that's with with Dana? I bet you Dana that's Dana sat it. down. Oh, I bet you that's it. And he was half cocked. Right. But if it's Howie show, you would understand, right? I mean, I I think if it's, if Howie's the guy running the show, oh, this makes sense because he's, they, he's they, crazy. You know, he that. wasn't Dana wasn't caustic or aggressive. He was just like, I've had enough of this. Yeah, you know, you know what I mean. Yeah, but Dana, I, I've been so. I saw Howie two days ago, a few days ago. I I was at his studio. Um, that motherfucker. I said to Howie two days ago, I go, you fucker, I told you to buy a warehouse. Who told you to buy a warehouse 10 years ago? <laughs> and he he goes, he goes, you did. I go, how much fucking money is that fucking warehouse worth now? And he goes, five times as much as what you paid for it. Really? He goes, I tell everyone every day, you're the one who said, <laughs> get a fucking warehouse. He's got five, I don't know, three warehouses, thousands of square feet. It's a beehive of activity. I'm like, the warehouse is the best. He goes, I when my wife, we argue over like furniture or whatever, put it in the warehouse. Like it just becomes, it'll save a relationship. It becomes a catch all. Wait, should I be buying a Every warehouse? Every celebrity should have a fucking warehouse. And and everyone goes, oh, I don't restore cars. I don't have a, it doesn't matter. It, 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 you'll have a thousand arguments with your old lady about, oh, I don't like that credenza or whatever. I'm not paid $700. For that. Put it in the warehouse. <laughs> Just goes to the warehouse. Every becomes a catch-all for everything you don't want in the house. Right. Any project, any car, anything right. you're working on. Oh, the big neon sign. I'm going to rebuild it. You said that two years ago. It's taking up a space in the ground. To in the, the warehouse. warehouse. <laughs> to the warehouse. It solves every argument. It's It always starts turning into a business. He's got his podcast, studios. I... I went and did Sage Steele's podcast, got that. But as you're walking through it, you're seeing offices and people. He set up his whole production there. But I told that fucker three days ago, I said, you better fucking thank me. And he goes, I <laughs> thank you 100%. <laughs> and, you know, um, houses, you know, uh, residential real estate, it, it goes up, but it ticks down. It's sort of up and down. Kind of depends on the market and interest rates and stuff. Not the warehouses. He paid God knows what for that, and it's worth five times wow. as much today. And he keeps keeps expanding. It, can I ask a question? Though? If yeah. he sells the warehouse, is there a mansion tax? No, I don't, <laughs> it's not. And and really, what you don't do is you can't sell it and take the profit because the, then they tax the shit yeah, out yeah, of the yeah. profit. You have to roll it roll over, over into yeah. a bigger right. warehouse, essentially. But that's him as warehouse, but. Dana Gould doesn't. Oh, Dana Gould. Dana White doesn't live out here, so he like flew Travel. in yeah, or yeah, came in, in, Vegas. in, in Vegas. and 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 Howie's warehouse is right by the Van Nuys Airport. So I think people fly in to the Van Nuys mm -hmm. Airport and literally go across the street. But he did all the calorie burning part, and then he got he up and saw left. Somebody because he was he was think, uh, just human nature. He was in himself thinking about something transpired. He was like, "I'm not fucking." Doing was he this. seething during that whole? Yes, he was yeah, seething. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He he was seething. I mean, but he was cool. He there's didn't... a conspiracy theory that it was a publicity stunt too, for him or for Howie. For Howie, obviously, to check out the show. And we'll I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what happens. I'll tell you, I'll tell you what it is. I'll tell you what it is. This is how the male mind works, and females, but male. Like okay, so. You, Frank, me, Adam, you know, there's been break-ins in the neighborhood, right. let's say. It's been crime, stuff. And then you hear the story about the house next door, and it's like, how'd they get into the house? They went in through the garage. The garage door was open, and then they went in through the side door, and that's how they got into the house and ransacked the place, right? And then you talk to your woman, and you go, we got to keep that garage door closed. <laughs> and they go, yeah, we do. And you go, somebody just broke in and went through an open garage. As a matter of fact, they'll drive around the neighborhood and look for an open garage, and then they'll go in. And you go, yeah, yeah. And then two days later, you come home, and the garage door's open, and they're just in the kitchen, you know. And then you go, hey, sweetie. 
remember, got to keep that garage door closed. And then they tell you some reason. I was in the garage, and then I had to go out of the garage. And you go, yeah, I know. I understand. I understand how a door works. But then when you're done, why don't you leave, and then you come back. Then we yeah. shut the garage door, right? And they go, oh, yeah, yeah, because I was in the garage, and then the car was outside. Yeah, I understand doors. I'm not accusing you of, of not knowing what a door is. But I'm saying then we close the door. Because remember, in the neighborhood, it has people breaking in. And then they go, okay. And then um, three days later, you come home. Garage doors again, <laughs> and you're sitting down at dinner, and they're putting the plate in front of you, and you're sitting there eating, you're not talking much. And then at some point, they're like, uh, Hey, did you see the Taylor Swift? And you go, You fucking skank, what don't you understand? What don't you understand? And then they go, What are you talking about? Is you, what's wrong with your steak? That fucking steak sucks. That's what it sucks. Fuck it, I'm eating in my office. I'm eating in my office. Because it's brewing. Right. It's brewing. Right. It came to a boil. Dana seemed like he was brewing, he was brewing. in there. Brewing. That's what I happened. think it was the, the woman's fault. Oh. The daughter. The daughter. The daughter. Well, I said she's, she's very on top of COVID. Yeah. And I think Dana's got a very aggressive... Stance, stance against COVID, yeah, yeah. and she could have asked if he tested. And she kind of looked. Maybe she always just has a resting uh, bitch face, but she looked a bit ang. Like, see her. Shh. Well, that's when he uh, left uh, again. You're talking to yeah. a guy who got her to physically leave, right? And then got Shh. her to cry. She looks. <laughs> I've been on two times. She's cried and like <laughs> she looks so, angry about something. One more, and she's on her <laughs> on her phone. It's funny that Howie's daughter's getting up and leaving when in the middle of my podcast, uh, and uh, no. I, he doesn't say anything. He just gets up and walks out. Yeah, yeah so this is why I don't work with my kids. Cannot work. With, <laughs> cannot work with your kids. All right, so maybe there's some precedent yeah, there. We'll see. I don't know. We will see. Um, all right, so there's this high school in Michigan, mm-hmm. and um, so. They're, the cheerleaders are asked to wear their uniforms on game day. Uh oh. But so they do. But then they're. But now they are saying that they have to wear pants under the uniforms at school because mm-hmm. the boys are getting too distracted. Oh. So, so short compl- skirts. Yeah. So they're complaining about that because they're like, well, we wear it at the games regular, and those are school sanctioned events. Why do we have to wear pants? I think it's something about sitting at the desk. Mm. I could see that that being a thing. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. Well, don't. But they're not just short. It's not like a skirt, and then you see the the thing. Right. You, right. The, those skirts have like built-in. Sh- they're like there's a. Th- yeah, because they're doing flips and stuff. Yeah, so you can't not, see anything I in, mean, at the games. Yeah, I don't. Well, so, yeah. So I don't know. I used to love when the cheerleaders wore them. Oh, of yeah, course, me too. Me too. Yeah, I mean, maybe maybe they were too distracting. Then, um, so they're but they're complaining. They're like, look. We can't even go out in our sports bras, but the guys working out, they can go shirtless, mm-hmm. run, you know, doing laps or playing yeah. soccer and things like that. So yeah. they think it's a double standard. They're complaining. They're going to the school board. The parents are, of the cheerleaders are complaining, too. They don't think it's fair that they have to wear pants. Yeah, I agree. But I also like sort of old-timey arguments. You know, this is like <laughs> in, in a world of school shootings and open borders and what are the Chinese up to? I like these kind of arguments. Yeah, these, right. these, if these were the if these were our, the only arguments yeah. it's that nice. we had, it's yes. it would yeah, be it's great. It would be like Rockwellian. It would be like, this is what we should be yeah. talking about here. Let's get the ruler out, measure the skirt to the knee. Distance, right, right. Make sure it's appropriate. Yeah, our school, I remember, I haven't had this thought ever, but... But we, you we were not uh, compelled to, but sort of it was understood that the guys on the football team wore their jerseys, jerseys. on home, I probably home game Fridays. 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 I never did that. And I, 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 I don't know why. I wasn't being a nonconformist. I was like, everyone knows I'm on this team. Right. And I don't need to wear my jersey in. So that these people know I'm on the team, but it wasn't about supporting the team. It's is it? I just always you need ayahuasca. I, 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 there's something <laughs> bubbling inside of me, some pain, some yearning, <laughs> some dark desire that's never been satiated, you, my friend. <laughs> I always thought it was like a little. Uh, I I don't know. I I, I guess I had a. a I guess I had a little nonconformist right. in me, and I just felt like it was a little lame that we did it. I don't know why, but I just never, I never did it. Yeah, I remember that. I wore my singlet. 
I wasn't supposed to, but I just like oh, to you're wear, wrestling. Yeah. Just like to wear my single. Oh, oh, it's game day, yeah. Is that weird? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> By the way, I work out in Equinox at West Hollywood sometimes, and there are dudes who show up there <laughs> in, in wrestling singlets. Really? I swear to God, there's a couple of guys that they, they work out in wrestling singlets, and I've complained. I've complained to Equinox. I'm like, I don't want to see this. What is? What are they doing? They're just working out with a big bulge. With singlets. Dolph it seems Lundgren, he goes there. weird to me. Who goes there? Dolph Lundgren. Dolph, Lundgren. Dolph goes there, and a bunch of my friends go there, and it's it's a really cool mix of people, and then some people just really extreme, and they wear wrestling singlets, and I wonder if they even wrestle. Well, there's only <laughs> one real way to find <laughs> yeah, out. <laughs> Roll up on them. challenge them to a duel. Uh, All right, what else um, we got? So, Rachel Dolezal, or her, extra, her, her new name now is Nikechi Diallo. Mm. Uh, which I believe means gift gift from God. Um, <laughs> she had her name changed. So she she took a job as an after-school instructor at a Tucson uh, school. Mm-hmm. And she also started an OnlyFans account. Mm-hmm. And now the school found out about it. Mm. And she lost her job over the OnlyFans account, which is like a, a thing that's happening now. I have a conspiracy theory that all these teachers and parents – get themselves or their kids kicked out of school to get the publicity because they're kind uh-huh. of skyrocket after they get so kicked out of school. So she was a teacher? Counselor? Yeah, Counselor? after school instructor is what, is what they... And what's they her name now? Nikechi Diallo. Uh-huh. Nick, that's her legal name. Uh, yeah, she had her name legally changed from... That means Dolezal. one who fools black people? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the OG <laughs> cultural appropriator. I know. I sort of... I like that there are people out there like this. Because after a steady diet of people telling me men are women and birthing people and, you know, men can be women and women can be men and stuff like that, I go, okay, then you you definitely can't draw the line at a white chick who says she's black, right? right? I mean, everything... If men can be women and women can be men, then everything's on the table. She was ahead of her time. But she, she, was, was, she did it in 2015, so... Right. So uh, now... it. it is is OnlyFans always sort of sort of pornographic? No, it's not, but it's always assumed. That uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh huh. It could be anything. I mean, it could it could just be you just putting pictures or any sort of content. You could do a podcast on OnlyFans, and people you pay you for that, right? Yeah, and they just subscribe to get your exclusive content. But are they doing stand up specials and stuff now, or am I making Brian Cal- only Brian Callen? He yeah. did it. Wait, they are getting into comedy. They've done comedy uh, events, and they I think they have put out. Uh, yeah, or like roasts. They've done roasts, right? Because I'll I'll think of who released theirs on that for a second. But anyway, all right. So she's doing. Yeah. So this is a this is she's 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 still in the news and she's now uh, been fired for OnlyFans account, which is uh, nine ninety nine a month. I always feel like poor Frank Dad killed himself, right? Yeah, with booze. Oh, so over a period of time, one day. One day? Yeah, I mean, he drank like 22 bottles of vodka. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's crazy. Well, he, I think he was afraid to do it any other way. Like, oh. that's, he, knew, he knew he was going to die if he did that. I mean, he was a chronic alcoholic. Shouldn't, don't you feel like Rachel Dolezal's dad should kill himself? <laughs> <laughs> and if he's dead, he should be rolling over. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> wow. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, but, but, but pragmatic. I mean, I get it. You know what I mean? I don't think I'd have the balls to jump off a Golden Gate Bridge or put a pistol to my temple. Oh, but, oh my old man? No, no. But I could drink he, myself to death. Yeah, so could I. It's easy. Yeah, it's <laughs> easy. easy. I mean, I've, I'm sure I almost have. <laughs> <laughs> you definitely made, yeah, yeah, made a few moves in my yeah. day. Yeah. And he yeah. said, he told me, you know, at the funeral, he goes, I'm not sticking around. Um, because, yeah, he was sober for a minute. And he's, I'm not, uh, you know, I can't live without her. I'm like, live without her. All you did was curse at each other for 52 years. Right. What are you talking about? And, uh, you know, he's like, <laughs> and that's, that's how he went out, man. He went out on, uh, you know, his vodka sword. How old was he? 71. Wow, he was relatively young. Yeah, I mean, relatively young. My mother was 70. Yeah, they were young, man. They didn't make it very long. Jesus. Yeah. All right, sorry for bringing the show. No, down. I'm no, uh, I'm gonna go do ayahuasca right uh, yeah, now. Yeah, no. <laughs> you gotta purge. purge it. You're not yeah. dealing with this, man. Listen, my mother had a great sense of humor, so she gets it. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, so let's go back to New York. You're talking about the, the migrants in New York and yeah. the, and the uh, Times Square gang attack and things like that. So there's a teen who was arrested for that. They released him, 
And then he was just now arrested again for robbery and larceny a day she, after he and three other suspects who still remain at large made off with about six hundred eight dollars worth of clothing they stole from Macy's. In yeah, they did they just did the the uh, robbery they, where they walk in this walk new in, phenomenon where stuff. they walk in. And I saw a group of women do this the other day on the news. They walk in and they steal uh, as many purses as they can, and everybody watches them. They and, film them, um, and they yeah. and they leave. Yeah. And yeah. there's no cops. There's nothing. There's nothing happening. They don't get arrested. Security and doesn't want to do yeah. anything. Yeah. Like, when I was young, I once stole a Kit Kat. And mm. to teach me a lesson, the, the cop took me to jail. Wow. No way. Yeah. Oh. And so I'm amazed at this. Again, I'm amazed that, uh, about the bystander apathy of it all. Nobody does anything. They just watch all these people kind of... They go right. into Apple. They steal all the phones, or right. The, right. The computers, all, yeah. and somebody's filming it. And there's no security. There's nothing, and nobody does anything about it. So what is what I? It's weird. It outrages everybody at home, but the people there. I mean, I don't think you're allowed to do anything because uh, if you do something, you can get sued for hurting the person who steals, or you get fired because yeah. the co corporation has expressly said you can't don't, get don't involved if you're an yeah. employee. Yeah, you know what? What what you realize, like really quickly is it is this really small percentage of people that are responsible for almost all the crime right and it, and if you think about it nobody dabbles in in it you, you do it or you don't do it and if you do it you do it multiple times you know you don't steal one catalytic converter and you're done <laughs> right. you de or but conversely you couldn't talk me into it. Like, all right, I'll steal one catalytic yeah, nothing converter. Will happen. Like, nothing will happen. You steal it. But but it's a small group of people, less than 1% of the population, that are doing 86% <laughs> of the crime. So with that in mind, when you do catch them, you got to fucking keep them. Right. Because it's a super small group that's doing all of the terrorizing and all of the thievery. Right. And this notion of, like... And now they just seem like, oh, the guy's been arrested 86 times and we're letting him out on bail or right. no, non-bail. And it's like, how would this be any – how would we solve this problem if this is the way we're approaching it? I, I mean, you, you know, this kid, for instance, mm -hmm. he's out like the next day and he commits the same crime. What if – what if he killed somebody? Right. Well, uh, one of the uh, employees uh, was assaulted. Was assaulted, and, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how do you let them out? I mean, where does it stop? So where does it stop? Right, exactly. And so and so now you're you're going to change that that whatever neighborhood that is, it changes, right? So the neighborhood changes. Now there's crimes happening. There's no consequences. Oh. So it changes the neighborhood. Now what do we do? What oh, do we, do? we need to. Queens. Oh, now we got to play uh, Crump, Benjamin Crump. What is that? Do we have that clip somewhere? Yeah, we talked about that, right? Yeah. Oh, Ben Crump. Ben the Ben Crump. <laughs> He's sitting around. Uh, <laughs> doing a, I do love these things. I, I do love when MSNBC or CNN does one of the retrospectives for right. Black History Month. Black men in America, 2024, and then they all sit around and fucking race hustle and bullshit and lie and nod, do a lot of head nodding. Uh, so this is attorney Benjamin Crump, right. and then it's Al Sharpton, yeah. and then it's a couple other brothers. And they're hanging around shooting pool, and they're talking about how to fix the system. Right. And right. so here's Ben Crump's take on it. We can get rid of all the crime in America overnight, just like that. And people ask how, Attorney Crump. Raise your kids. Change the definition oh. of crime. Mm. Of course. Well, yeah. If you get to define what conduct is going to be made criminal, you can predict who the criminal is going to be. I mean, it sounds yeah. like we are criminal, though. Yeah. Our existence no, is the culture. criminal. But they no, made no, no. the laws They that made way. the law to criminalize our culture. To fit up. Black culture. Mm -hmm. I mean, and so when I think of Eric Garner, I always think of stuff like that. Lucy cigarettes. I did nothing. We sit here the whole time. I'm not business. All right. But comply with the cops. Comply with the cops. Oh, that's that's what I would right. say, and right. stop you from getting choked out. But anyway, Ben Crump's got an idea. Just change the laws. Stop making stuff that black people do illegal, and then there won't be yeah, crime. But, but yeah. He Wait, also uh, tries to make the <clears throat> argument that our <clears throat> laws in America are based on prosecuting black people, and it's not true. Our form of government was kind of borrowed from England. England, 
Where yeah. There were zero. Well, black there's also they, they tell you all this shit like they go. Well, then how come black people on average, you know, young men get a longer sentence than white men who commit the same crime? And you go, huh? Well, that's something. I mean, that that sounds like something you have a white guy and a black guy and they committed the same crime why does the black guy get a longer sentence if 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 not the system if the system isn't biased against right. the black guy uh, well black guys have a much longer rap sheet and so it turns out the average black criminal has many more arrests than the average white criminal and the judge factors in the multiple arrests into the sentencing the sentence, right. and now you have your fucking answer which CNN doesn't get into that part of it they just right. get into the first the first part of it uh, but anyway this is the approach. The approach is if black kids aren't performing well in math, then we need to figure out how to adjust the scoring system so that they get we'll get rid of fails and we'll get rid of D's and we'll we'll get rid of anything under 50% in a math test and then they will be mathematicians and if too many black guys are getting locked up then we will take crime and we will eliminate the definition of crime so that they can't be locked up now what none of these pussy cowards ever tell you is when a dad is in the house and a dad raises a kid and disciplines a kid the kid turns out not to be a criminal bam but that's the answer that no. these fucking four geniuses and cowards will Will never bring up. No, yeah. it's right. it, it starts in the home. As right. a parent, it starts in the home. That's you right. can low. Listen, you can lower. Uh, you can lower all of the uh, you know the qualifications, whether it's crime or education. We're just going to have a lot of dummies. We're just going to mm -hmm. have a lot more dummies who have edu who have degrees, but they're they're dummies, and we're going to have a lot a lot more criminals. And yes. and you know it, it, it it's 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 all so crazy. N not unlike this, the, the, the CEO of United saying, listen, we're not going to hire the best pilots. We're going to lower, if we have to, we'll lower the qualifications of becoming an airline pilot so that there's more inclusion. Right. right? So we're fair. We're being fair right. to the people who aren't getting the licenses to drive planes, which are probably, I don't, uh, will I ever fly United again? I'll never fly United again. I'm, I, I, I mean. I won't, <laughs> unless it's eight bucks cheaper. Right, unless it's a little <laughs> bit cheaper. Seattle, but and then it's I'll that fucking whole, It's that whole, it's that whole thing. It's like, you, you, you know, it's what we go back to. You got to do the work, man. You got to do the work. The work starts at the home. You know, as a father, I have got to father my children. And if I father my children the right, right way, my kids are deathly afraid of doing drugs deathly afraid of stealing anything deathly because that the consequences are me to them right and so my friend my, my children do really well in school because a they're intelligent but b because i'm on their ass all the time i'm always on their ass because i care about them and they understand yeah. that right they're like dogs you know they they have a job to do and they know you do you, you pat them on the head they're doing well they'll keep doing well right yeah. And that's what that it, it, it's all about the family. It's about the family. And all of my intelligent friends, black, white, green, yellow, Spanish, whatever the fuck they are, they know that. It's 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 the home. Yeah. You know, and, no. and, and that's that's the most ridiculous, <laughs> divisive bullshit yeah. that you could ever listen to. <laughs> well they suck at pool. On a good news in the uh, racial front, we got Kamala Harris. And the reason I love Kamala Harris. She should Harris, do mushrooms, by the way. We and and ayahuasca. Maybe stop drinking so much. I love Kamala Harris because when Biden announced I'm going to uh, only look at women of color for my, the vice presidential position, I, as the only person in Hollywood, went, that's a fucking horrible idea. And everyone else goes, what's wrong? What's yes. wrong with it? What's wrong with it? I'll, I'll tell you what's wrong with it. You've shrunk your pool of competent people to next to nil. Like if you think about it, like you go, First, they got to be a Democrat. You go, all right, there goes half half the pool. Then you go, they've got to be a woman. And it's not 50-50 women in politics. You know, no. it's probably 70-30. So you go, it's got to be a woman. You shrunk that thing down pretty, pretty dramatically. And then you went, and she's got to be a woman of color. And now you're down to 2%. That's your pool. So you're looking for the second most important job in the land. And you shrunk your pool 
down to nothing. Like, what the fuck? What do you think? What, you think a Ferrari ran their F1 team that way? I must have. Uh, first off, we're eliminating all guys. Yeah. We're eliminating all Italian guys. We need a quadriplegic. We need a quadriplegic. We need somebody in a wheelchair. We need a woman. She's got to be a woman of color. Like, okay, but you are eliminating a lot of people who could be good at this job of running your F1 team. You're eliminating. Oh, that's what I'm doing because I'm a fucking hero. All right, you fucking heroes did it. And you got Kamala Harris. Now you have a person who polls lower than the president. I didn't even know it was possible in the past to poll lower than the president because normally the vice president kind of flies under the radar. Yeah. And it's like, I, you know, you may not like Obama and you may have issues with him, but they go Al Gore. You go, I don't know what he's up to. He seems nice. You know, or whatever, whatever, whoever that guy is. I don't think Mike Pence ever polled lower than Donald Trump. You have someone who polls lower than Biden. <laughs> Biden is senile. Biden is losing it by the day. When you look at clips of him from three years ago, his eyes are open. He seems lucid. Now one eye is closed and the other eye is half Can't open. Understand what he's saying. Can't understand what he's saying. And now you sanctimonious dipshits are stuck with Kamala Harris. You're fucking stuck with her, you fucking retards. You did it. I told you not to do it, but you did it. And now you have a vice president who's a female, who's a female of color, but is more incompetent than the guy who's senile and pulls worse than the guy who's senile. And now you fuckers are in a quandary. Because you go, normally just be next in line. It would be Al Gore would just slide up. You know, if, if Obama left, then we'd all go, all right, now we're going with who's on the bench. You know, who's on deck? Right. Who's in the hole? You just slide right up to the, to the on batters, the, the batter's box. You can't do that because you guys made a decision not based on competence. You made it based on the color of her skin, which is racist, and her gender, and you fucked yourself. And now you have to do some sort of dance where you go around her somehow <laughs> or you eliminate her. You can't. But you can't. You can can't. you replace you her with no. a white dude? Absolutely. Like, how's Gavin Newsom? He's a, he is a heterosexual white man. He's going to replace your woman of color, your precious woman of color. How, how are you going to negotiate no, that? No, how are you going to thread that needle? You can't. You're fucked. And fuck you, because I told you not to do it in the first place. And you went ahead and did it. And you all patted yourselves on the back. And no one ever stopped and went, does this bitch know what she's talking about? And he went, I, I said, we're hiring a black woman. She's got to be black. She's got to be a woman. Yeah, I know. But is she competent? And he went, well, I don't know. That's not that's not what we're, we're not doing that. There. We're doing this. You know, it's United Airlines. Fine. Now we're trying. <laughs> we're flying a 737 into a volcano. Right. I hope everyone's satisfied. Yeah. yeah You're yeah. fucking idiots. Yeah, now they're stuck. They're <laughs> stuck and they're fucked because he's not going to make it. And they're going to have to figure out what to do with her. You know, and as a guy who can't vote because I'm a felon, um, there, I said it. From when you stole the Kit Kat bar? <laughs> no, a little after that. I can't vote. Like, I don't have, I don't have a dog in the race. And, and I find it interesting what is happening, the names that are being circulated. And it is, it is, it's almost offensive. What's, What's your felony for? Assault. Huh? Assault. Assault? Assault. Assault. Oh. Mm. It was a long time ago. Man. Yeah. Was it? What gender was the person? Uh, it was a male. Okay. Well, that's a good start. Yeah. And, it was a male. you know, they Phew. did something to you? To a family member. Oh. And that's it? You can't work it off like a DUI or something? I may be able to. I just never really gave it How long's it been? Thought. Oh, my God. It's been 20 some odd years. You should do ayahuasca. <laughs> you. you it's, but it may, it might as well have been yesterday because I could feel it on you. Yeah. You could feel it on me. Yeah. No, it, no, it's interesting because I don't vote because I can't vote. Um, man, I'm, so many people are going to know. <laughs> um, I look at things a lot differently, man. Mm. I just do. I, That's I, interesting. You know, I don't look at it from you know blue or red. I, I really get to look at it as which person I think is the most, as you said, the word competent, is the most competent to get this country, you know, back, I hate to say this, but back on its feet or back in a place where I recognize it again. That's interesting. Do, do you know what I mean? No, no, it's like, 
when you travel, you go into a small town in Europe and you kind of walk around and you just observe. Right. You're not in the town. You're not right. a villager. Right. And you can kind of go, oh, they got their shit together with this. Yeah. But they need a little help in that because yeah. you're not in the I'm village. I'm not in the village. And I don't, you know, and I get to listen to everybody's opinions and stuff. And I'm like, it doesn't, it, listen, my 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 vote doesn't matter because I don't have one, right? So, so let me kind of look at this thing a, a little bit more objectively. You know, and I found, listen, I've found interesting things about all these people, not Kamala Harris. <laughs> no. Well, I have found interesting things. There's plenty of interesting things about Joe Biden. There's there's a shitload of interesting things about Donald Trump. And and Robert F. Kennedy. And Robert F. Kennedy, Jr. who I, I, I watch and listen to all the time and and how they try to, what they're trying to do to him. I and, agree. But there's nothing interesting about Kamala Harris. That, that's I, one person I do not want to be the president of the United States. I've listened to her speak <laughs> on a number of, of occasions, and I, I was waiting for the words to come together and form a sentence or a paragraph. The coherent thought. And where she had a beginning, middle, and end, and I, and maybe I'm losing, maybe I'm getting senile, I can't find... What she's talking about. I have no about. idea what yeah. she's talking she about. She puts yeah. words together. Well, we've been to the get, the border. I've been to, I haven't been to the border. We've been to the border. What are, where, where, I don't, I've not been I don't to Prussia. Know, I don't What's know that her, her the euphemisms border? and analogies I don't know what and, she's talking and, about. And, and metaphors. And I can't make heads or tails of what she's saying. <laughs> and to me, she, and again, I don't have a, a horse in the race. She appears slightly inebriated. And coming from a guy who's grown up with a father who was a raging alcoholic, I, I I don't think she is the one who should be running the country. So I think, you know, that side is right in looking at Gavin Newsom's. I've, I've heard I've heard oh, no. I've, I've heard Michelle and I despise him. Um, but, you know, I've heard Michelle Obama's name being mentioned. And I'm like, how are you ever going to get around that? To go there. I mean, I don't know how that even works. How does that even, you know? Well, we're going to get some insights because uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and Cheryl Hines are waiting in the on deck circle. I'm, a, I'm, 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 a, I'm a, like, I feel kind of cool that I was in the same day as, as uh, yeah. Robert F. Kennedy. Lights out, by the way, Frank Grillo's. It's movie. lights out. Very good. Very good. Yeah. On VOD. And in theaters today. Frank, always great to see you. My pleasure, We brother. love your candor. And we'll talk to Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and Cheryl Hines right after this. You're about to hear a preview of The Jordan Harbinger Show with Bill Browder, who uncovered a massive fraud inside the Russian government and took on one of the most powerful men in the world, Vladimir Putin. Well, I was sitting there, now 90%. They were going to steal my last 10 cents on the dollar. So I took a decision which nobody had ever taken before, which was to take on one of the oligarchs. I did. I fought back big time. Sergei and I exposed the crime. The same people who Sergei testified against arrested him and then tortured him to try to get him to withdraw his testimony. He was really a man of steel. On the morning of November 17th at 7.45 a.m., I got the call from Sergei's lawyer, and it was the most horrifying, life-changing, soul-destroying news that I could have ever gotten. For more on how Bill Browder continues to fight for change while being a thorn in the side of Vladimir Putin, check out episode three, which is one of the most popular episodes of The Jordan Harbinger Show. Well, good news. It's O Rewards Bonus Points Month at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Shop in the store, do it online to receive points and get rewards sent straight to your phone or inbox. Get two, three, four even five times bonus points on select purchases. Receive bonus points on select items throughout the store like wiper blades, antifreeze, coolant, parts cleaner, motor oil, and more. Those bonus points can help get you to your next rewards even faster. You'll receive a $5 reward for every 150 O reward points to use on your next in-store or online purchase. Members, can check points and rewards online anytime. If you're already an O Rewards member and not receiving your rewards, just add an email address or mobile phone number. Get a $10 reward for updating your existing account. If you're not an O Rewards member yet, signing up is easy, quick, and simple. Just do it online at O'Reilly. 
O'ReillyAuto.com or in-store at O'Reilly Auto Parts. The Adam Carolla Show presents Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s birthday cocktail party for January 17th. Let's see who's invited. Let's welcome the Italian Pope who excommunicated Elizabeth I of England, Pope Pius V. The co-founder of the Salvation Army on the Adam Carolla Show. With his lovely wife, Cheryl Hines, as well. That is the best birthday date we've ever done on this (laughs) show. It's the most robust. It's the most diverse. I've never... I've never had, we've done 50 of these things, and that is by far the best. Yeah. So good, and good on you. And you forgot Benjamin Franklin. Yes, I oh, did. So we, we, yeah, how how did you forget no, Franklin? I, I had it on floor. my list. When I made the list yesterday. I produced it this morning, and the way I made my list, I just overlooked it. So that's 100% right. on me. Uh, the show, Night of Laughter, that'll be this Wednesday, as you're hearing this, February 21st. First, downtown LA's uh, Grand Central Market's million dollar theater. I'm going to be performing there. Rob Schneider's going to be performing there. Tim Dillon's going to be performing there. Bobby Lee and others will as well. Cheryl is going to be emceeing. And uh, I, for one, am looking forward to this evening. I am too. I can't wait. I want to, I want to hear all the, all the jokes. <laughs> Finally, something funny in politics. <laughs> yeah, it, it it would be nice to get back to uh, at least, I mean, we, we had it. We used to kind of have that. I mean, even Reagan would, would tell some, some jokes, you know, and have some isms and things like that. And I, I kind of miss that. And I think, uh, Robert, I think people think of you as a very serious man, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> I don't think they know there's a sort of warm, friendly, affable side side to you. And I don't know how it works. Do, do you get with your team and go, you got to push that that side out so people know the, the real Robert F. Or or you maybe you can expand on that. I, I don't know if they do. Uh, yeah, they do uh, uh, probe me. <laughs> so, uh you know, to to show more of the lighter side. I don't, you know, I think I think that comes out if I do the longer form interviews, like the podcasts and stuff, where there's more opportunity to go to off road uh, and to you know lighten and, up a little and to lighten up yeah. a little rather than kind of the standard uh, standard political questions. By the way, this is funny. Uh, people should go to Kennedy twenty four dot com if they want to get tickets. And it's for when, next Wednesday night. Yeah, okay. in in Los Angeles. Yeah, and that'd be the twenty uh, first, just in case people right. want to mark it on their their calendar. You know what I love? Remember that <laughs> that picture that went viral of uh, Mr. Kennedy walking barefoot on the plane. Yes, <laughs> and then and then he goes on TMZ and he apologizes. And in that video, he's barefoot at the airport. Oh yeah, <laughs> no that I that I that I like. And I yeah. was I was. I get scrutinized all the time because I don't wash stuff. I eat stuff that's been on the ground. I don't really wash my hands. I I believe that too much sterilization is what's making everyone sick. I tell people all the time, when I was a kid, nobody was allergic to peanuts. There was no peanut allergies. I didn't know one kid who's allergic to peanuts. And now everyone's slathering Purell on everything and sterilizing everything. and, And you've compromised your immune system. And then everyone calls me gross. But when you were walking up and down the aisle barefoot, I thought that's smart. But I, and I did not judge. But I also wonder: Do you f- share that in that you need to expose yourself to things? Yeah, I do. I think that that's true. I mean, I, I, uh, I just like going walking barefoot. So, <laughs> but, but I, I'm the same way that you are. Is that I'm I'm the opposite of a germaphobe. I have no fear of germs, and then you know I've been. On the road for now almost nine months, and I shake hands with hundreds of people every day, um, sometimes thousands of people. And I, do, you know, I'm not that careful. I'll go eat a sandwich in the car right after doing that, and uh, I, you know, I, I don't get sick. A knock on wood, because it could happen any moment. But 
Um, I do, uh, you know, I grew up playing in the dirt and the mud and not being scared of germs and no, nobody ever talking about them. So, uh, and I think, you know, people during our generation, as you say, we're a lot healthier. We've now got the sickest generation in the history of our country. We have the highest chronic disease rate. When my uncle was president, I was, you know, 10 years old. We six percent of Americans had chronic disease. Now it's sixty percent do, and all of this cascade of, of autoimmune diseases, of neurological diseases, of uh, of of, uh, uh, of autoimmune allergic diseases, all began appearing in the late eighteen nineteen eighties. Nineteen eighty nine was the big change here, according to EPA. So, oh, um. We're talking about comedy, honey. Yeah, okay. No, yeah. no, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. You right. <laughs> let me get to the punchline. Okay, get to the punchline. Sure, oh, right like, the, the, no, I, listen. I don't mean to cut you off. I'm, I'm with you. I watched your very eloquent speech, Q&A, at your birthday party a few weeks ago. Uh, I learned a lot. And I'm always kind of curious why this country seems to avoid certain subjects and seems to embrace others that are less valid. So during COVID, that was a great opportunity to talk about diet and exercise and obesity and disease and sunshine and vitamin D and all these subjects that we could have really gotten back to. But somehow we completely ignored that and argued over how effective ivermectin was. And that's all That's all we did, or hydroxychloroquine. And I wonder how much of this is planned and how much of it is just some sort of societal whiff where we're just not hitting the important subjects. Because people like you, people like me, people like Bill Maher said, look, the people that are dying of COVID are fat, or they have, uh, they're obese, or they have pre-existing conditions, and here's a way to to remedy that. And yet, we never discuss that, and we shout it down. Anyone who dare bring up, all right, well, how about you lose a few pounds, and maybe that'll make you healthier, and it'll be better for your joints as well. And somehow we've labeled that fat shaming. And is this all part of something that is planned, or are we just? a society that has become unmoored in a, a drift in a, a sea of bad ideas. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that, that there's a lot of um, pressure to that. There's there, that there's that there are f- economic and financial incentives for people to focus on the pharmaceutical paradigm and pharmaceutical solutions and that's fortified by the fact that about uh, almost 60% of advertising revenue for the for the uh, news sites for the network news are coming from pharmaceutical companies and they're making those investments you know partially to sell their product but also to dictate content and so i think there's you know people who are talking about uh, the things that you're talking about are actually good health, uh, fortifying your immune system, getting a lot of sunlight, being outdoors, that they're shot it down. I mean, during the pandemic, one of the things that was really disturbing is that people were you know, were getting ticketed for being outside. You know, yes. And near where I live, they were ticketing surfers in Malibu who were out on the water. <laughs> and telling them to go home, a thousand dollar tickets. They were closing the basketball courts. They were, you know, they shut at the skate the skate parks. The, the half pipes down in Venice. They put sand on them so people couldn't be out there. I and, know. You know, and that doesn't make any sense because this was a disease that didn't spread outdoors. It spread indoors. But you were taking people who were doing healthy things and getting vitamin D. No, I, I I I agree. And Cheryl, I'm going to comedy right after this. Uh, pronunciation, but I, declaration. I, it would. It felt when I when I would drive down PCH. I'm in Malibu half the time as well, and I'd drive into work. I'd be going down PCH during COVID, and I would look at all the beach volleyball courts with all the nets taken down and just the stanchions up, and I thought that is such a symbol of how 
we got it wrong when it came to COVID. The best thing you could do is exercise, sunshine, be on the beach, and we literally tore down the nets. And I just thought that was so, it's so symbolic. And it almost felt, I felt like a graveyard to me when I drive past it and nobody's out there. And yes, they took the sand and they filled in the skate parks. And essentially they just did everything wrong. Now, Cheryl, I've also been watching uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm. Yes. And, uh, and it's strong this year. It, it is. And I watch every season. And yeah. sometimes you get out of the gate and you go kind of go, eh, the first one was a little, uh, but they, they're picking up some steam or whatever. Uh, I've seen the first two. Great. makers. They're great. Yes. And I don't, uh, can you feel it when you're a part of it? Like we go, oh, this, this one's really, really working. It's kind of hard, actually, because we, uh, you know, it. The, of course, we're not shooting in front of an audience, so you don't feel that. Um, I don't know, and there's no script, so you don't read the script and see it all and go, oh, this is hilarious. So it's it's hard to know until you're watching it, and then, <laughs> then you think, oh, okay, <laughs> this is insane, but people will like it. <laughs> Yeah, but do you share my this season? And maybe it's because it's the last one. I don't know. It just feels ex- exceptionally yeah. strong, at least the first two yeah. offerings. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's fun because it's sort of classic Larry. <laughs> you know, he did something good unintentionally. He would never do anything nice intentionally. And then now, you know, and then now we'll see what happens from his good deed. <laughs> I'm sure nothing can go wrong right. from it. <laughs> but yeah, he gave a, a a woman water in line who was in line to vote in Georgia and got arrested for it. Yeah. And so now, and now in Curb, you know, he some people think that he's a hero, that he's standing up for the people in Georgia that aren't allowed to get water when they stand in line. Um, so it is hilarious. It's classic Larry. <laughs> well, speaking of voting, Robert, um, what's your take on mail-in or ballot harvesting? Or I, I feel like most people that I speak to just go, why can't we just have election day? It's a holiday. You don't have to go to work. All you have to do is vote. One day we get the results that night and we don't have to worry about a new batch coming in and, 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 and any of the negative side effects that come along with some of these other ways modalities of of voting but i i've heard arguments on both sides and i don't know where you come down well i mean I, you know my initial um, uh, argument would be that you should encourage everybody to vote by making it as easy as possible and the mail-in ballots did that so let's do it but i think uh, at this point looking at them there's so much it's the, the process has so 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 much doubt among American people about whether the voting system is fixed that I I think that it may not be worth it. Um, you know I think that we ought to we, you know we're the we're the wealthiest country with the exemplary nation we're supposed to be modeling democracy for the rest of the world. We we put a man on the moon. You know we we make Teslas. We do all this. We ought to be able to have, make a voting machine that everybody believes in. We, there's ATM machines on every corner in every city in our country, and none of them ever gives you too much money. You know, they never right. mess up. And, and you, have, you know, we go to Las Vegas, there's an entire city built on this presumption that you can make machines that can count right and then never get it wrong. Right? All the slot machines. And and um, so it's pretty hard to to, to you know, to understand why don't we have a voting system that works. I think we need machines that work. Uh, we also need paper ballots at the voting booth and that every ballot has a pay, every vote has a paper record to it so that if there's any question about it, that we ought to be able to go in there and count, recount them on a very, very low threshold of doubt. Uh, I think it's really important for Americans, for all Americans to believe that the voting system works. And there's enough problems now for the mail-in ballots that are coming out that I don't, I think they're probably not worth it. The, um, 
when I was listening to you give your speech in the nicely pointed backyard in Encino, one of the things that struck me is when you're talking about home ownership. And I feel a big problem in this country is people not having skin in the game. You know, when you're not a homeowner, when you don't pay taxes, when you don't have a ID and things like that, you're not really in the game, you know, and we need people participating and, and feeling like they're skin in the game. And I, I think the lack of home ownership is a big problem because I think it disenfranchises people when they're not involved, you know, and it's sort of the difference between you can tell the difference between a teenager who's mowed lawns all summer, saved up, worked hard and bought a used car or a car that their rich stepdad gave them. One car's covered with dirt, it's got fast food wrappers on the dash and the other's being looked after because there's a sort of pride in, in the earning of it. And I think about LA, I've lived here my whole life. My, my grandparents, my parents, they bought houses in North Hollywood. The first house they bought was $10,000 in 1952. Uh, the second house was $12,000 in the, the 50s. My dad bought a house in deep North Hollywood, crap house, you know. He bought for like $17,000 in like 1971. These people were school teachers, worked for the Veterans Administration. They weren't celebrities. They just had jobs, regular Jobs like people used to have. A house in the Valley is $1.7 million now. Does the person who works at the Veterans Administration, like my grandmother, who made $51,000 a year, or the school teacher, there's no possible way. It's, in, it's impossible, and it needs to be remedied. And I, you were talking about that, and I wish more politicians would have some take on, on this and I was curious if you could sort of hit some of those talking points that you spoke about so eloquently. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely critical. And homeowner, we're going now from a ownership society to a rental society. And when you do that, you go from being citizens to being subjects for all the reasons that you said. It. Two years ago, the average cost of a house in this country was $215,000. Today, it's $400,000. And the interest rates have gone from 3% to 7.5%. And there's no but kids who are, you know, our kids' age. Well, we have we have six kids between 20 and 30. And none of them is thinking that they're ever going to be in a house. And they're not going to be. And one of the reasons that it has you know, spiked so much higher than the inflation that's affecting everything else is because you've got these giant corporations like BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard, Fidelity, Blackstone that are buying up all the houses. Last, last year, I saw this data point actually this morning, 26% of home purchases were by investment houses. And they're though you know our kids are having to compete against the the biggest corporations in the world for the cost of money, and they can't do it. And uh, and if you don't own a house, you know they're, they're, if you own a house, you care about as you said, you care about your community, you care about the schools, you care about the police, you care about the transportation, you care about the appearance of it, your, your neighbors, you care about all these things. But more importantly, you have an entree. In the American capitalist system, because you can borrow money, you own equity. So you can go get a second mortgage and you can build a yoga studio or a bowling alley or a saloon or a bar or, you know, or a bookstore or a sporting goods store. And and it and that creates this ferment that, you know, created the American middle class, as you pointed out, after, after World War II. People could get into houses without financing them. They were buying houses for cash, you know, and, and particularly with the, the VA, you know, the uh, VA bills that, that, you know, made it so that uh, veterans had easy access to cash for houses. And then the highway system that made, that had, you know, made cheap, cheap housing all in the outside of the cities and many other programs. Now, our leaders understood that it was critical. Thomas Jefferson said that American democracy is rooted in the control of the landscapes by tens of thousands of independent freeholders, each with a stake in our system of democracy, each with a stake in our economic system. 
this is how we we made the American middle class, the beginning of the 1950s, the greatest economic engine in the history of mankind. Now we're going the opposite direction. And our kids, not only they, they can't buy a house, they're not going to be able to participate in capitalism. And that is going to be really bad for our country. So one of the things, you know, I've said that I'm going to do as president is I'm going to get everybody in this generation into a home. Anybody who wants one, who's who's willing to work hard, lay by the rules, you're going to be able to finance a home. You're going to be able to, uh, you know, to do, I mean, the, the central promise of the American dream when you and I were growing up was if you worked hard, you played by the rules, you could finance a home, you could take a summer vacation, you could raise a family, you could put something aside for your retirement, all on one job. There's yeah. nobody in this country that believes that that promise applies to them in this generation of kids. And it's, you know, they've, they're they losing faith in our country. There's losing hope for their own futures. And that is a disaster. There, you know, there was a poll, Adam, in 2013 where where Americans under 35 were asked, are you proud of the United States of America? 85% said yes. The same poll taken four months ago, 18% said yes. So, the, you know, the, we've lost a whole generation of kids who no longer believe in the United States of America and they no longer um, have hope for their own futures. And, and that happened in the administrations of the last two presidents, a Republican and a Democrat. Uh, you know, the parties are not are not, you know, they're, they're responsible for what's happening. And and we need to we need to change uh, direction. You know, I, I think the home ownership thing is it even goes sort of well beyond finances. And it's true. You need equity. You need to get loans off it you, that that then start small businesses. And there's a whole bunch of practical stuff. But there's an emotional part, which is. When you don't own anything, you don't care. And and I remember when I was very poor and I didn't have anything going on in my life and I live in an apartment with three guys and a one bedroom and stuff, I used to ride a motorcycle and I rode a motorcycle in the rain and people would sometimes go, aren't you scared? And I'd go, what do I care? <laughs> I don't have anything. It doesn't really matter. Like, you know, when you go... You hear about some stories, 17-year-old guy shot and killed a liquor store owner for $30. Why would you risk going to prison your entire life for $30? It's like because he didn't own anything. He didn't care. There's nothing to protect. You know, when you get older and you, God willing, get some assets and, and some property and things like that, and it affects your behavior. You can't, if some guy hassles you, you can't punch him in the face because you go, that guy's going to sue you. He's going to own your house. You know, he's going to mm -hmm. take away all that you all that you have. You can't, you know, hire someone and then sexually assault them in the bathroom of your work. That person's going to own your company. You know, it, it kind of also affects your behavior as well. And it affects it in a way we would like. And uh, so I agree. It's a very important subject but it goes beyond financial it's kind of what 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 kind of society are you trying to shape and and i don't believe anyone talks about it but i i also more specifically heard you talking about an actual plan to do this like a first time buyers and just because it hopped in my head when i was in the ninth grade we moved into our first real house in North Hollywood. It had two bathrooms and a, and a sink that was split down the middle. I remember going, there's two sinks in this one sink. My mind, mind blown, you know, and, and it had normal stuff. It was modest. It was small, but it was in 1978, 79. It was about 90 grand, 95 grand. So my dad was making $24,000 a year working as a, teacher basically and his house was ninety thousand dollars a year now his same job now would pay sixty two thousand dollars a year and his ninety thousand dollar house would be one point eight million dollars that's basically the math for owning a house especially certainly around here but i know your plan was specific and I'm, I'm curious if you can share that with my audience. Yeah, I mean, we have a whole bunch of initiatives to get kids into homes. And uh, one of them is 
to make it uh, less profitable for the big investment houses to own homes, to use the IRS code. And also there's a bill now before Congress that I support that would prohibit, that would make it very, very difficult for investors to own, to, to buy up, you know, hundreds of homes, which is they're doing now. The other thing I'm going to do is a, a program that my uncle did very successfully, which is to create a 3% mortgage. And, uh, and, and, I'm going to do that without raising the debt. And the way I'm going to do it is to sell treasury bills at 3% interest, but they're tax-free. So it, the, the the mortgages will be financed by the market. I, and, you know, if you have a, a rich uncle, you can get a much better rate from the banks if, if that rich uncle will co-sign your loan because the bank is basing their your loan rate, not on your lousy credit rating, but on your rich uncle's terrific credit rating. And what I'm going to do is give everybody a rich uncle, which is Uncle Sam. Oh, Uncle Sam will guarantee the mortgage and get you a much lower rate. And uh, if you don't pay it back, you default and, and, you know, Uncle Sam gets the house. And we did this with Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, and there's a $100 billion surplus in those programs right now. Um, I was in a uh, an apartment building that was financed through my uncle's program a couple of weeks ago in Tampa, Florida. And, you know, the people were paying like $175 a month rent. And, uh, you know, because it was one of these 3% uh, mortgage-owned buildings. So um, it's doable. It's been done before. It's been done in a lot of different ways. But, you know, I'm going to do it in a, in a very, very big way that's going to get these kids into houses. Cheryl. Yes. Uh, on the uh, acting front. Yeah. Um, for you, is it uh, about writing? Is it about creating? Is it about acting? Is it about, you know, sitcoms uh, or, you know, independent films? What, what, what do we think the future is for you? Um, you know, it really just depends on the project. I like, and the people that are doing it. You mm -hmm. know, you get um, to a certain place in your life where... And you know this as well as anybody. Sometimes you end up working with people who uh, <laughs> make it maybe tougher than it needs to be. Um, so I'm really drawn to, to uh, like a very, of course, everyone is a, a great story, a great uh, voice you know, a specific voice and then people that I really want to hang out with for the next 24 years, <laughs> like Curb. Did you, um, has it been 24 years? Yes. Oh, so you know, crazy. Curb started as a one hour um, special mm -hmm. that Larry was going to return to stand up. And that was, that was 1999 uh, actually. Wow. And then, and then we started shooting the series in 2000. Has, has anyone ever commented that Larry, when he walks forward, is leaning backwards? You know, he looks like the keep on trucking guy. Yes, <laughs> or Ichabod <laughs> Crane. But either way, he's, he <laughs> lives the only walk. person, like most people walk with purpose and they kind of lean forward. He actually his legs lead the way. leans back and his feet are three feet yeah. out ahead of his hips. I know. It's hilarious. Yeah, I... I, I uh, I love I love that show because in Hollywood, especially in the sitcom mill that I've been through and Cheryl's been through, they constantly talk about likability. You got to be likable. This guy's got to be likable. You know, Jim Belushi's got to be likable. You know, everyone's got to be likable. And I'm always like, well, what about funny? And they're like, oh, but likable. And I'm like, well, Carol O'Connor and uh, Archie Bunker, you know, and he wasn't likable, but he was super funny. And they go, got to be likable. And I like that Larry David is unlikable, <laughs> leans into being unlikable, but all is forgiven because he's so, because everything is funny. Yeah. Yeah. He's, well, you know, it's so interesting because he, of course, created Seinfeld with Jerry Seinfeld. And it was the same uh idea right that these characters right. were were not <laughs> <You> all reprehensible <laughs> right 
But um, it's it's so interesting because that was such a successful show and people had such a response to it. But really, the networks didn't follow suit with that idea, did they? They no. still they still needed like, well, let's 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 make the people likable or let's learn a lesson or let's make it, you know, wrap it up in a nice way. Um, and then so he did Curb and then, yeah, he's still proving people really like unlikable people. <laughs> How? Well, as long as you're funny, uh, yeah. because it's it's like saying that athlete is unlikable. But if he's scoring 40 points a game or he threw three touchdowns in the Super Bowl, then all is forgiven. Yeah. And I feel that way with funny. But speaking of a guy like. Larry David, and I'm interested because you guys are in Hollywood and you have to kind of navigate Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And I have my Hollywood friends and, you know, I've told them, well, I like Robert Kennedy, you know, and they go, well, I, yeah, but then the vote's going to be taken away from this guy and we can't have Trump. And now you're, you might be supporting someone who's going to hurt. And I'm like, well, I don't like Joe Biden at all. And I want something different than Joe Biden. Um, and I'm, and I'm open to almost anything different than Joe Biden. But I don't know. How are your friends kind of treating you? Because I think the general consensus is like, oh, yeah, Robert's good and we like his ideas. But he can't win and he's going to screw our guy and then we're going to end up with Trump. So thus, we don't appreciate what you're doing. Are you running into that? Ah, uh, yes, there's <laughs> some of that going on, I would say. But also, there were a lot of supporters, uh, even in Hollywood, that um, that surprised me. <laughs> no offense. Um, but, <laughs> but yeah, it, so there are a lot of people that are supporting. There are those people that say, oh, well, he's going to take votes away, which doesn't make much sense to me because people are voting people are voting the way they want to vote so it you have a choice we're giving people a choice of who to vote for right. so that seems strange to me i um, heard i heard yeah. that uh last year um because you know uh robert may have been getting scrutinized from some for some controversial comments that he offered to say that he was separated from you and they even made a press statement about it. But how did that conversation go down? Well, it was, it, listen, it was a very um, s stressful, emotional time. There were high emotions everywhere. And, um, and I, uh, I mean, just, there were people coming at me. There was stuff coming at me from all sides. And Bobby felt really badly about that uh, and said, you know, I can just, we can just separate, tell people we're separating so you can get out of the line of fire, which was uh, sweet. I think it's sweet. It's like protective, right? Yeah. yeah I want to say the, the, the thing that they said, I said, I, I never said, but hmm. Yeah. At that point, you know, which was to compare the Holocaust to the um, uh, to the COVID lockdowns. I never said anything like that. Uh, but that's how it was reported on CNN and then it spread virally. And I w wasn't uh, at that point, And even today, they don't let me on CNN or any show to, uh, to do a live interview to say, hey, I didn't say that. So we were getting taking all the incoming Nothing was going out. You know, Cheryl worked very, very hard to build her career. She came from, you know, very, very little in North Florida and moved out here in a Toyota Corolla when she was, you know, in her early 20s with no money and 130,000 miles on her car and got a job, you know, waitressing for and uh, and then other stuff for I don't know, 15 or 20 years and then built a, this incredible career. And all of a sudden, you know, I'm instead of helping her, I'm actually, you know, hurting her. And that was, you know, my job is is to protect her. And uh, I felt, you know, very, very upset about what was happening to her because of me. 
Oh, I, at that point, because I couldn't go on TV and talk about it, you know, I had to think of other alternatives of how to protect her. So. Yeah, it it's something I experienced during COVID, which is my only goal is to be accurate. And I believed I was accurate all through COVID. And I said anything I wanted to say with the caveat that it was accurate. But the women are they have many more factors than accurate. They have a lot of social pressures and, and things like that. And so they're going to be affected in a different way than you're going to be affected because m your only concern is accuracy. And the internet is not interested in accuracy and neither is CNN. And I, I never, I don't even know what happened to journalism anymore. This thing where it's like, they got it wrong. They got it wrong. Did they get it wrong? They had your tape. They had it in its entirety. They edited it in such a way that made you look like you were sort of Hitlerian. Is that getting it wrong? Or is that a deliberate hit piece, which is going on constantly? And and then not letting you come on, of course, and, and make it right. Although I think you did a pretty ad admirable job in real time making it right from the, from the clip I'd witnessed and then the full length clip of what you actually said. But... This is a very scary time in our in our nation, which is you have something that you know about and that you're being accurate about. And you have people in your family and in circles and in Hollywood and friends saying, just shut up. Uh, you may be right, but just shut up because we don't want to deal with any of this and because our careers are being taken away from ourselves. And now you, you're in this position of, oh, well, I'm accurate and I'm correct, but now I have to shut up because people on the internet are trying to destroy my family or my partner. And I believe that's the beginning of the march toward hell. And, <laughs> uh, and I think we're taking it back. I, I, do, I don't think they could pull off what they pulled off four years ago in terms of the media and now. There's too many independent yeah, voices. I, I, I'm hoping that that's true. I'm hoping that, you know, people are, are onto it. I mean, one of the, you know, all of these institutions of democracy kind of collapsed, particularly during COVID. They've been on a trajectory for that since the 1980s, but it really uh, was kind of the coup de grace during COVID. And not only the the, you know, the regulatory agencies, the public health agencies, the, the press, Congress, all of these, you know, major institutions and the, and the medical uh, profession, but also uh, comedians. Something really disastrous happened to comedy during the, the uh, during COVID. And, you know, our, I'm very, really happy about about what we're doing on Wednesday night. Uh, because it's kind of part of the resurrection. You now got a lot of really great comedians out there who can laugh at what happened and who are questioning authority again. And during COVID, so many comedians just stopped questioning authority and they became not funny because, you know, so much of comedy is about that tension of that, of, you know, of exploiting dissent and of, you know, questioning the absurdity of, you know, anybody who gets themselves in a position of authority, you know, becomes bad things because start to happen to them. They become dictatorial. They, uh, yeah, I agree. Well, need to laugh at that. I want to get a plug in, by the way, that'll be a night of laughter. That'll be Wednesday, the 21st, downtown L.A. I'm going to be there. Bobby Lee's going to be there. Tim Dillon's going to be there. Rob Schneider's going to be there. Uh, I'm, I will be, you know, after my set, I will be happy to make my way around the room and have a drink with people and say hi and take a picture. Oh, nice. It's always my Thank pleasure. You, it's going to be so fun. Thank uh, you, Adam. So you're going to be cordial. I'll be cordial. <laughs> like Larry. Wow. I also... <laughs> And it's funny you said you shake a thousand hands and then you jump in a car and eat a sandwich. I shake a thousand hands after a show and go back to the green room and grab a handful of cashews from the bowl without washing my hands. And then everyone says, you're gross. And then I go, I'm never sick. You're sick all the time. So I will press all the flesh and then I will go backstage and eat a sandwich with Robert and Cheryl without washing my hands. Just eat a dirty sandwich. I'll together. eat a dirty sandwich. You can go to Kennedy24.com for tickets and we're all going to be there. Um, so 
comedy. It's interesting. So as as uh, my assessment on COVID and what I w- one of the things I said repeatedly was I I said once you've got to the comedians, you've got to everybody. And that is a very ominous and bad sign for a society because you can get to the school teachers and you can get to the bus drivers and you can get to the union employees and the federal government and things like that. But when you get to the comedians, you've captured everybody. When you have comedians scared to talk about the biggest subject in the land, that means you've captured everybody. And I looked at it as a very sort of eerie harbinger. And I questioned a lot of comedians myself. And I think what happened with comedians is what happened in all facets of jobs, which is the ones that were very well-known and had deals and had network deals and had contracts, they were silent because they didn't want to be canceled because they had a lot to lose. It was the second strata of sort of up-and-coming guys who weren't household names, many of them are becoming household names now, who did not have the big deals and multi-year contracts with HBO and NBC and ABC and whatever. Those are the guys that were speaking, but it was all monetarily driven. The ones that were comfortable, had a cushy job and a long contract, were not only silent, but but spoke out on behalf of, of big pharma lockdowns and whatever whatever the protocol du jour was. It was the substrata ones who were on the lower levels who didn't have so much skin in the game and nothing to lose, who did most of the speaking out. And sort of righteously now, these are now the guys we tend to listen to over the people who were in the catbird seat who got it wrong all throughout COVID. Yeah, I think, I mean, the one guy that I saw really distinguish himself from the beginning was J.B. Sears, who I'd never heard of before. Mm-hmm. He's been on. And, yeah, he's you know, been on the show. He, he was very, very visible, and he was, you know, he was good. He was making these little videos that were really, you know, very funny. And everybody stopped laughing during COVID, because I, I didn't even see the middle-tier guys, because... I think there was a limit on the forums in which they could even speak. And, of course, if you did speak, you couldn't even get on YouTube. Yeah. So, you know, you, there, were, there were so many blocks to anybody being funny. But you're right. All of the really big like people that you know were always laughing at authority, Republicans, Democrats, the Jimmy Kimmels, the Steve Colberts, all of these people suddenly and who were you know brilliant, brilliant comedians with you know just incredible timing and great intelligence, and you know suddenly it was that was frightening. And I, I like what you said that if you can get the comedians, then you got the whole thing sewn up, and that they. They did that. They succeeded in really uh, disarming those people. Yeah, you know, and I was talking to Tucker Carlson on this show, and he was candid, and he said, hey, if I was 31 and I worked for the New York Times or I had some job, some paycheck, and I was in my early 30s and I just had a couple of young kids, I would have shut my mouth too because I, I, I had stuff to lose. You know what I mean? I think, I think the notion of us being independent and maybe living a little outside of the system and not relying on the system for various reasons, uh, usually something financial, but some for, we all got here in different, different ways, then you could literally afford to speak your mind. I don't know. And I was pretty vocal about COVID all the way through it, but if I was in a union And uh, I was, you know, had a nice job and a couple of young kids and I was relying on that paycheck pretty heavily. I don't know. I may have shut my mouth. And I think I think they, the powers that be, sort of relied on a lot of people wanted to hang on to their to their livelihood and thus say things that maybe they didn't think, but sort of had to to get along. Um on the subject, and I, it comes up from time to time, but uh, Secret Service protection. It's always something I find interesting as it pertains to you, especially if we, you know your family's history. And it sounds 
kind of nefarious that they won't grant you that and how much in resources you have to put toward that. And that's one less dollar you have toward the campaign. Is it nefarious? Is it standard procedure? Is there a protocol? Is there a precedent uh, for this not granting you Secret Service? What's your personal feelings on it? it the, um, the, you know, my prior to my father's death, there was no people. You didn't get Secret Service protection until you were the official nominee of one of the two political parties. And then when my father was killed in June of 1968, all of the uh, the people who were then running, like Eugene McCarthy, Hubert Humphrey, George Wallace, all of them got immediate Secret Service protection. And then Congress the next day, and then Congress uh, passed a law saying that everybody got it within 120 days as long as you meet certain metrics. Which and the metrics are basically that you have three polls over the past two months that are major polls that, that have you over 15 percent, then you're entitled to it 120 days out. However, the president has discretion to give it to people much further out than that, and that's what they always have done. There is never until me, there's never been a presidential candidate in history who's requested it and not gotten it. And they've given it to at least, I think, 40 people. We have a list of my uncle Ted Kennedy got it uh, almost 500 days out. And President Car uh, Carter, who did not like my uncle, they didn't like each other at all, gave it to him before he ran. So as soon as he, there started to be rumors that he was going to run, he got Carter gave him Secret Service protection. That was a classy Thing for Carter for Carter to do, uh, but it's hard to name a candidate who has not gotten it early. There, there are more of them that have gotten it early than have not got than than not. So, uh, Jesse Jackson got it. Uh, uh, okay. you know, Obama got it. I think five hundred days out, Gary Hart got it. Uh, uh, yeah, anybody you can remember got Secret Service protection. It's unprecedented that they didn't give it to me, and particularly, as you say, because my family history. And also then, you know, the Secret Service came in and they did a, an investigation. We we provide them with 65 pages of death threats and other threats to me, credible threats. And they said um, that I have they, their conclusion of their report says that I have an amplified risk. And um an elevated risk, that was the, the term they used, an elevated risk, and they recommended me getting it, and uh, Mayorkas turned it down. Clearly, he talked to the White House, because he's not going to do that without the White House, and turned it down four times. And, you know, since then, we've had, you know, gunmen showed up and uh, tried to get into my green room with, you know, multiple, two shoulder holsters with loaded pistols, a backpack filled with armaments, including a laser uh, sighted pistol and, you know, multiple clips and, you know, knives and everything else. And uh, and, and we, Sarah Cheryl was sitting right over here not long ago and, uh, and just watched a guy climb, up, climb over our wall while she was doing a podcast. And uh, and then saw the guy, a guy chasing, you know, one of our security guys chasing him down with a gun and, you know, handcuffing him in our yard. Wow. And, um, you know, in the middle of her podcast, she said, I need to take a break for, for a second. So, uh, what, well, you know, what, I, what I, the way that I think about this is that um, two things. One is we're watching the weaponization of federal agencies like has never happened before in American history. The, the politicization of our federal agencies. And we've seen that, you know, I saw this with the Twitter files and, you know, I have a, a lawsuit. I just won a, and Biden versus, or Kennedy versus Biden. I just won a big judgment or a big uh, motion today on that case, in which they said, yeah, the White House was deliberately ordering these social media sites to censor you. And they were using the FBI, the CIA, the DHS to communicate that they were given portals into the social media sites. 
to take off my posts. And, you know, they deplatformed me from Instagram under orders of the White House. And that has never been done before. When my father went into the Justice Department, the first week he was there, he called up all the branch division uh, chairs of the Justice Department. He said, we are not ever asking if somebody's Democrat, Republican, there's going to be no polit political decisions in this department. You enforce the law. And that's how, you know, that's why Americans' democratic institutions were revered around the world. Because they were incorruptible. They had they didn't have that, you know, they weren't like a, a banana republic where you have the, the agencies of the government who are now part of the political party of, you know, in power and at their disposal. So I think it's really, it should be troubling to everybody from that point of view that now that's crept into the Secret Service where they're being used politically to harm a, a candidate who's running against the president. The other thing that I think it shows, and I was thinking about this today, that I've known President Biden for maybe 40 years, and I've known, and he's always been a good guy. He was a decent guy, you know, as far everything that I could see about him, that he was a, he was a guy that would never, ever do this. He would never do this. And and it makes me just think that uh, he's not making decisions there because this is not the kind of decision that he would make, that somebody else is, you know, there's some anonymous guys in lanyards who you never won an election, who you never heard of before, who are, you know, calling the shots there and they have no accountability. And, uh, and you know, I, I think they don't have the strong moral guardrails either. So... Uh, that's how I'm kind of thinking about it. What uh, last two questions, actually. So what what is your take on how this is going to shake out? Uh, Biden seems to be declining and he seems to be picking up speed in the in the decline, which is how it works. You know, it, it sort of starts off slow and then it happens fast. What they say about bankruptcy as well. And he's, he's at that point to me from my observations and many others that the decline is gaining some momentum and the next, you know, nine or 10 months, could be a bigger decline than the previous three or four years is what, what it sort of neurologically looking like to me. And I'm not sure if he's there for, for the election. And so then we get, uh, we get Gavin Newsom, we get Kamala Harris. We talk about Michelle Obama sort of parachuting in. Nobody has a full, no one can fully wrap their hands around it. I will say those who said to me six months ago, oh, get the hell out of here. Biden's in it for the long haul. He'll be the nominee. They've changed their tune in the last several months. But I'm curious what your take would be on that. I mean, my take is that um, it's, now, uh, it's now permissible to talk about it. And the press is calling him on it. You know, I've tried to stay kind of away from it just because I, I've tried to stay away from personal issues. You know, the lawsuits, the per prosecutions, the, the Hunter Bidens, et cetera, of just and try to, you know, focus on issues that unite people rather than this sort of, you know, those issues. And but I think now we're we're we're, we're at wars on, on two fronts. We're facing a, a nuclear power that. Um, that has many, many more nuclear weapons than we do, and much better nuclear weapons. The Russians have these now oh, hypersonic weapons that can't be stopped by anything that we have in our arsenal, and we've never had that in history before, and they've got a thousand more of them than we do. And they have a much better defensive uh, nuclear arsenal, so they can shoot down ours more. And we're pushing them, and they've said we're going to use them if it's existential. And um, and then, you know, with the war in Gaza, which is now spreading across the Middle East, you know, we need, we need a, a president who, th th there's so much nuance and complexity to the kind of decisions that you make. And these are decisions you may have to make very quickly at, after getting a, a three o'clock a.m. phone call. That, you know, where all of our children's lives are at stake. 
So I think it is important now for people to ask the question and for President Biden to take some steps to show that he actually is cognitively capable of meeting those challenges. And I, I would say that, you know, going, engaging in a debate, even, you know, being public in the campaign and engaging in unscripted encounters with voters, um, that that's important. But to, just to stay in a basement and, um, you know, it's like weekend at Bernie's. A lot of people are using that phrase now. Um, and I think American, you know, the American media, the mainstream media is now raising the issue. So I think it is fair to raise it. And uh, I think the White House really has, bears the burden of showing that uh, that he is he has the cognitive capacity and the acuity, the mental acuity to actually grapple with the really important challenges that are going to face him in this job. And I, then, you know, on yeah. the other side, you have President Trump, who, you know, who has a lot of legal challenges. So, um, and again, I'm not going to comment on those, but we, we have uh, uh, the people, the, the people who are saying, the Democrats who you know are saying that I shouldn't, shouldn't run because it's going to um, give the uh, election to draw to President Trump. Uh, Pre President Biden does not need my help to lose to Donald Trump. <laughs> and, you know, he's 10 points behind him in the polls right now. And my, you know, our, the, all the public polling is showing me taking more votes away from President Trump than from President Biden. I, I hope, you know, it's, it's basically even. Uh, but, you know, the ones that show a difference, I'm taking more from President Trump than President Biden. Do you think Biden's going to be there at the end? I don't know. I mean, I have no way of knowing. I, it, it's a guessing game for me and for everybody else. The Democrats have a very bad, are in a bad position because I think a lot of black Americans who feel taken for granted by the Democratic Party will be upset if, if Kamala is not, you know, what, what the way they've set it up is that President Biden now is winning all the primaries by default because everybody else has been driven out. And so he will control all the delegates in the convention. So he personally will be able to pick his successor. Those delegates are, which he owns those delegates, and they're going to do what he tells them to do, at least on the first ballot. Oh, he'll be able to, to pick a successor. And, you know, if, if, they, if he torpedoes Kamala, I think it's going to anger a lot of black Americans and the Democrats cannot win without getting 80, 85 percent of the black vote. And I'm running already into, you know, voter, black voters all over this country, particularly black men who feel that the Democratic Party has taken them for granted and, and is not going. And they're, you know, they, they, they're not interested in, in voting rote anymore. Oh, I think unless they find a uh, another, um, you know, an African American to to substitute, if they get rid of Cam Kamala's numbers are just terrible. Yes. Yeah. I don't yeah. They they they've painted themselves into a corner with their sort of racial division proclamations, and now yeah. they can't substitute out a black woman with the Gavin Newsom, and they deserve it because they were hustling. They were race hustlers. They created this maze, and now they can't make it through their own maze. Uh, let me plug one more time. I'll see you guys on Wednesday, February 21st, downtown L.A. Grand Central Market, million-dollar theater. And uh, it'll be Rob Schneider. It'll be me, Tim Dillon, very funny stand-up. Bobby Lee, very funny stand-up. Cheryl. Cheryl, not as funny <laughs> a stand-up, but a great <laughs> MC. I'm not <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure she has some jokes. Some jokes for Kennedy Twenty Four dot com is where you go for tickets, and uh, I'll be out doing my set, pressing my flesh, and eating my dirty sandwich backstage with Robert and Cheryl. Uh, thank you, guys. Look forward to seeing you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks so much. Hey, Cheryl, congratulations on uh, twelve seasons of Curb. It's an all-time show. Yeah. Thank you. It's all I really time. Appreciate it. Thank all you. All right. Thanks, you guys. 
All right, I'm going to be in Las Vegas at Jimmy Kimmel's uh, Comedy Club. That'll be this Thursday. And then uh, you can go to amcrow.com for all the live shows because I'm going to be all over the place. And uh, this Friday is the 15 year anniversary of the podcast. Oh, it is. Right? Oh, 15 so, years. So look forward to that, whatever that means. Frank Grillo and Lights Out, his movie, always a great guy to chat with. Until next time, Adam Carolla for Max Patton, Robert F., and Cheryl, and Frank saying mahalo. Mahalo.